दरवाजा बंद कर दे बिना दरवाजा बंद कर बेटा बिना दरवाजा बंद कर बेटा बिना यार मेरा दरवाजा बंद कर दो यहाँ से Morning and warm welcome to online analysis. A postgraduate teaching program on Zoom platform, sponsored by Acrola and hosted by A1 Logic, and shared by Analysis TV. Today we have interesting uh, lectures on transplant analysis. Yeah, for that we have three experts in our platform. First topic is by Dr. Gomadi on uh, garden retrieval for transplant, and uh, the second topic is by Analysis for renal transplant by Anil Kumar Sharma, and third topic is. Analysis of a liver transplant by Dr. Anubam Raj. Today's session is coordinated by Dr. Rajesh J. Prakash, sir. What is, sir? Uh, good morning, sir, and good morning, Om uh, Mandal. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, good morning, good morning, Om Mandal. So today we have uh, we have a very interesting and important topic, not only for uh, theoretical purpose, but for also for clinical practice. because the transplant anesthesia is the one which is uh, coming up in a very high level because of all uh, newer forms of uh, gadgets and modern anesthetic techniques and all and so and uh, what lot of government programs are going on promoting the organ transplant everywhere so today we have three eminent speakers to talk about that uh, organ transplant so we'll start with our first topic uh, organ retrieval for transplant anesthesia by dr gomathi karmeenam uh, she is our uh, our own uh, faculty which is an uh, uh, coordinator for um, online anesthesia teaching program and she is an associate professor from department of emergency medicine uh, madras medical college uh, chennai and she got, she had got involved in this uh, organ retrieval program from tamil nadu for tamil nadu government by dr gomathi karmeenam so uh over to you madam gomathi madam over to you thank you thank you so much uh, for this uh, wonderful introduction uh, so am i is my slides visible yes ma'am yes sir so uh one minute starting from so uh my talk is largely going to be about how we are going to maintain the uh, brain stem dysfunction patient and uh, how we get them into the on the uh, perioperative management of the organ retrieval per se now with the uh, improving healthcare we all know that the demand for organ transplants has rapidly increased and uh, there is always an associated morbidity associated with uh, live transplants so disease donors are always a good alternatives but these patients require aggressive and intensive monitoring and we need to optimize them right from declaration of brain death to organ retrieval so it's not an easy work and it involves a multidisciplinary team work so every uh, doctor in every specialty will be roped in to help uh, uh, maintain these patients but we should always remember that the anesthesiologist is the center point or around which the whole program pivots so our words really matter we don't say cadaver anymore we call it as disease donor and it's not about organ harvesting it's about organ procurement and uh, this uh, uh, publishing uh, this edition of uh, the world brain death project which is published in 2020 they actually have recoined the whole term they call it by as death by neurological criteria so it's dnc so it's not brain death it's not disease donor 
it will be say D and C. So death by neurological criteria. And uh, this is a, a BJA uh, a publication by Corbett et al, where they talk about perioperative management of the organ donor after diagnosis of death using neurological criteria. And they say it's a severe irreversible structural brain injury which leads to irreversible loss of both the capacity to breathe and the capacity for consciousness. Now, uh, brainstem death could be because of trauma or non-trauma causes. In my emergency department, we mainly get a lot of uh, road traffic accidents, traumatic uh, uh, brainstem deaths, but there are also non-trauma causes, especially when there's uncontrolled hypertension, a rupture, a AV malformation, or a rupture of a berry aneurysm, etc. So, what actually uh, happens is uh, the, the 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 rise in increase in intracranial pressure is often due to the three factors, as we all know, it can be due to cerebral edema, hydrocephalus, or due due to the uncontrolled bleeding, and this actually stops the blood flow intracranially, and the brain dies irreversibly. Now. Even though the criteria is irreversible coma, absence of brainstem reflexes, and the cessation of breathing, we always need to rule out poisoning, alcohol intoxication, drug overdose, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, coma, chronic vegetative states. We also have to rule out this electrolytemia, uh, any uh, uh, myxedema, or any subjective, uh, any hypo or hyperglycemia. So there are many things which have to be ruled out before you can. Um, you, you can come to a diagnosis of a patient being brain stem death. So, as I said previously, we need to maintain these patients as far and as close to the uh, physiological uh, homeostasis as possible. So, it's very imperative that we know the pathophysiology that runs behind. So, what happens as uh, uh, intracranial pressure rises? We all know that the central sympathoadrenergic regulation of circulation and the pituitary temperature, everything is disrupted uh, due to the irreversible loss of brain function. And there is also interruption of the hypothalamic pituitary adenocortical cortex. So we are losing all of that. And there will be massive release of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, from the brain, necrotic brain tissue. And uh, added on to all of this, we are going to have a massive hormonal imbalance and hypothermia. So what we actually will be seeing is a pushing reflex where you will have uh, bradycardia and hypertension initially. So when the ischemia spreads from the pontine, um, pontine to the medulla oblongata, the vagal nucleus is involved and there's intense vasoconstriction and uh, there's bradycardia. But uh, this is followed by a marked sympathetic stimulation. So you get a catecholamine st storm right. and the bradycardia is now replaced with tachycardia. And as the ischemia progresses down the thoracic uh, sympathetic chain, you will be having profound hypotension. Now, when the patient, when you see the patient initially, you will, be you will need to treat all of these with so the bradycardia hypertension. As you're treating the hypertension, the patient will fall into massive Hypotension. So unless you know the pathophysiology, it's going to be very hard to uh, take care of all of these. And uh, about the heart, you, we all know because of the catecholamine uh, surge, there's intense vasoconstriction, a rise in systemic vascular resistance and the afterload. Um, this all, the, the tachycardia produces depletion of ATP, the myocytes, and there's increased myocardial oxygen demand. And uh, added to this, there's severe hypotension, which compromises the coronary perfusion. So all of this put together isn't a very good picture for the heart, and uh, it often causes myocardial injury and uh, cardiac perfusion injury. Uh, there are other causes of hypotension. It can be physiologic, maybe central diabetes insipidus, which I will be talking to you shortly. There may be hypothermic cold diuresis, relative adrenal insufficiency, and decreased oncotic pressure. Now, these are the physiolog pathophysiological things which will uh, start rolling on. And there will, there will also be uh, iatrogenic things which is going on, like the neurosurgeons would have started the patient on mannitol, and we may not be giving adequate fluids, there'll be ongoing blood loss, 
And uh, suddenly when you realize the patient is hypothermic, you will start rewarming the patient and the patient goes in for hypertension because of the vasodilation. Now, the respiratory changes, we all know uh, lung is also uh, retrieved, but it's sad to say only 10 to 20% of the lungs are eligible for harvesting. And uh, the reasons being neurogenic pulmonary edema and because of the pro-inflammatory mediators, the neurogenic pulmonary edema again, again happens because of the sympathetic storm. There is intense vasoconstriction. There is increase in cardiac overload. Now that causes an increase in left ventricular, left atrial pressures. There's an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance. And because of all this, there is an elevated hydrostatic pressure, which damages the capillary endothelium and pulmonary ed edema. And uh, this will cause the neurogenic pulmonary edema. There will also be other respiratory changes because of the chest trauma per se. The person might have uh, got hit by a car or a lorry, and he may have multiple uh, chest injuries. An ICD might be there aspiration, pneumonitis, atelectasis, and there may be prolonged ventilation leading to nosocomial infection. There was a patient where we had to maintain him for five days, and even though the lungs were okay in the you know, initial period, it wasn't very salvageable, salvageable after that. So the prolonged ventilation doesn't work well for us. And the renal changes, this is very important because the uh, pro-inflammatory uh, uh, mediators, they, they, you can find a lot of... Uh, uh, an enormous amount of infiltrating T lymphocytes and macrophages uh, in the uh, uh, renal vasculature and endothelium. So this is the reason why ATN follows in diseased donor transplants and we do better in life transplants. Uh, the endocrine changes are very important. Um, mainly the, both the anterior and posterior uh, pituitary are affected, but the posterior uh, pituitary is affected more and that the, the lack of antidiuretic hormone causes central diabetes insipidus, uh, which manifests as polyuria, polydipsia, and hypernatremia. Uh, usually, the anterior pituitary is well preserved, um, not as much. In fact, it's not as much affected as a posterior pituitary. Uh, the TSH and thyroid hormones, even though they are normal, the, the patient shows a picture of sick thyroid syndrome. And uh, there will always be hyperglycemia because of the reduced insulin and also because of the insulin resistance. And hyperglycemia is not only because of this, it will also be because of the catecholamine storm. And we will be using a lot of 5% dextrose and uh, mannitol. So these are all uh, the other causes of hyperglycemia, which we need to keep in mind. And uh, hematological changes, uh, this has to be treated uh, immediately and as and when. Um, the anemia, there will be all, there will be bleeding, ongoing bleeding due to the trauma. And uh, coagulopathy is because the necrotic brain tissues release thromboplastin and plasminogen activators, which results in DIC. So this will also result in bleeding. And uh, we will have leukocytosis because of the systemic inflammatory response. So these three have to be monitored and they have to be uh, treated as early as possible before they produce a catastrophic change. And hypothermia, um, this is also very profound and it happens very early. And it's mainly due to loss of the thermoregulation centers. There's reduction in BMR, excessive heat loss. And we all know there is loss of the shivering mechanism. The patient cannot shiver anymore. And the other causes are uh, exposure to cold and again, hydrogenic massive infusion of cold IV blood or blood products yeah, often because we, we don't know that this patient is uh, brain dead initially until the neurosurgeon tells us. So this is uh, one reason, um, maybe iatrogenic. And we all know hypothermia results in altered cardiac function, arrhythmias, bleeding, and uh, there will be a reduced oxygen delivery to tissues. So the general management will be we always put in a central line and um, start continuing uh, continuously monitoring the central venous pressure. We also put in an arterial line and we have to monitor it continuously. Whenever you put in an arterial line, make sure to, to put in a gauze a bandage and label it because there will be multiple people coming in. You always have to protect the arterial line and make sure nothing is inadvertently injected into it. A nasogastric tube is inserted, police catheter insertion. And always, always change whenever necessary, all the care lines, intubation tube, police, whatever, 
change it as and when it is necessary. The head should be elevated for 30 to 40 degrees. Always use a warming by blanket and maintain body temperature around 36.5 degrees Celsius and broad spectrum antibiotics, eye protection, frequent airway suction, and also prophylaxis. And uh, monitoring, as I said, all this should be uh, the IBP, CVP, everything is continuous. ABG, we do it every six hours, and the urine output is checked every hour. And uh, as for Miller says, it is always a rule of 100. Systolic pressure should be more than 100 millimeters per mercury, urine output more than 100 ml per hour, PaO2 more than 100 millimeters of mercury, the hemoglobin concentration more than at least 100 grams per liter, blood sugar 100% normal, and the temperature 35.8 degrees Celsius. I'd love to stick on to it, but in my institute, the therapeutic targets, if I get all this, I'm really happy. MAP more than 65, hemoglobin 10 grams, sodium less than 160 millimoles per liter, potassium 3.5 to 5, um, central, C, central venous or mixed venous oxygen saturation more than 70%. SpO2 at least more than 92, ABG within normal range, except uh, exception of permissive hypothalamia, and uh, lactate less than three millimoles, blood sugar, hourly uh, urine output 100 to 300 ml, and the central body temperature more than 36 degrees Celsius. Of all this, I think the, the main things will be my MAP, my hemoglobin, my electrolytes, um, my SpO2, hourly urine output, and my temperature. So that is what I, and by and large, it's really not easy as the days pass on to maintain a patient within this physiological range. It's very difficult. So the hemodynamic goals, you will always try to maintain new bulimia. So you need to be cautious not to overload the patients. We do not want to overload the patients. And always, always maintain hemodynamic stability with the lower range of inotropes, which is given to us. Optimize the cardiac output to keep perfusion pressure uniform across all organs. See, we are going to maintain these organs and they are going to go as graphs to the recipient. So this is really, really important. You need, you need to minimize the use of vasoactive agents. Anything too much, any, anything of excess is not too good. So the three management strategies will be volume expansion, vasopressors, inotropes, and hormonal replacement. So let's see what is the ideal fluid. In our institute, we go with half normal saline and 5% dextrose. And we use uh, soda bicarb, 150 millimoles per liter in one liter of 5% uh, dextrose if the patient has hypernatremia and acidosis, which will occur in central diabetes insipidus. Or we can use plasma light A, which you all know is a balanced salt solution with multiple electrolytes with a pH of 7.4. And always, always do not hesitate to use blood and blood products whenever it is necessary. And in our institute, we go as a tech guided just to make sure we give in the right blood product and we do not load the patient too much. And the vasopressor supports, <clears throat> there's a widely divergent opinion regards the use of inotropes at their dosages. Uh, these are the dosages as a patient comes in, uh, we normally start the patient on dopamine, noradrenaline, and vasopressin is started from the start. And uh, hormonal therapy as per the United Nations of Organ Sharing, now, this uh, triple therapy is after 10 years of data, uh, which uh, actually covered the hormonal replacement therapy, and they found that it is beneficial in most uh, organ uh, retrievals. So we, it goes by uh, methyl prednisolone, 15 milligrams per kg soon after brain death uh, dec uh, declaration, I mean confirmation, and 24 hours later. So uh, we all know that this steroid will counter the release of pro-inflammatory mediators uh, uh, from the patient or uh, from the uh, brain death patient. And then uh, we need to start give uh, start the patient on vasopressin. It will be one unit bolus followed by 0.5 to four units per hour. But we do not use uh, such a high uh, uh, volume, uh, uh, high, such a high uh, dosage. We go by 0 0.03 units per minute. So it's one unit bolus followed by um, uh, point. Uh, uh, zero, 03 units per minute in our institute. And uh, thyroid hormone replacement, uh, if you have the injectable form of T3 and T4, you can follow the, uh, the regimen given here. But in our institute, we go by L-tropsin 300 mics uh, OD and uh, uh, that is a B, uh, every eight hourly. And uh, we, we give it uh, through the RILES tube. And of course, insulin infusion to maintain blood sugar 
between the range of 80 to 150 milligrams per deciliter. So this is the hormonal therapy and it's very imperative. We start this very early. So uh, the patient has a very good, uh, the donor has a very good outcome. And of course, do not forget to give appropriate antibiotics according to your hospital policy or by the culture reports. And uh, regarding the respiratory management, we always need to uh, adopt a lung protective ventilation. So you target the lowest FiO2 to keep the PO2 above, say, 100 millimeters above me and normocapnia. Always, always avoid pulmonary edema and pulmonary toileting, uh, suctioning every hourly. So we normally check, uh, we keep the tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml and the plateau inspiratory pressure below 30 and keep uh, around 5 to 10 centimeters of water. And uh, please remember, you need to uh, diuresis to euvolemia wherever overload exists. So overloading pulmonary edema is a big no. We need to be very careful. Now uh, you have maintained this patient. Now you need to diagnose brainstem death. So uh, it's there is no universally accepted thresholds for what is normal. It is left to institutional policy. Now before you go in for an apneic test, as I said, you need to maintain the core temperature above 36 degrees Celsius. If it's not, please warm the patient. The systolic blood pressure needs to be more than 90 millimeters of mercury. If it's less than that, correct hypotension with fluids and vasopressors. If there's dyselectrolytemia, correct electrolyte abnormalities, and the ABG should be near normal. If it's not, you need to uh, restore the acid-base balance. Is the patient still comatose? Rule out any drug effect. See if there's any drug overdose or persistent effect of sedation or anesthetic agent or neuromuscular blockade. You need to wait for at least four or five half lives uh, until the offending agent is eliminated. You check off, consider dialysis or other reversing agents. And, um, and you need to check for the brainstem reflexes. Now, when you are checking the brainstem reflexes, you are going to see the cranial nerve between two to 10. And uh, this is very, very important. And uh, we, the first thing is you need to check complete unresponsiveness to painful stimuli by supraorbital pressure or temporomandibular uh, uh, pressure. Do not attempt your nail bed, nail bed pressure because again, that is uh, the patient might move because of Lazarus because the spinal reflexes are intact. And then you need to check for corneal reflexes, oculocephalic movements or doll's eye movements. 30 degrees up and the calorie, oculocaloric tests where you inject uh, 50 ml of ice water and tracheal section is suctioning for gag reflex. So these are the tests done for the brainstem reflexes. And if everything is normal, we need to perform the apnea test. So before conducting the apnea test, we need to remember that it's not done by one person alone. It's a three member team. Uh, the neurosurgeon or the neurophysician, the anesthesiologist, along with the physician. So it's a three-member team who conducts the apnea test. And uh, we need to ensure the temperature is okay, the BP is okay, the ABG is okay. And if the patient requires high doses of vasopressors, high PEEP or FiO2, we need to uh, skip this apnea test and go in for confirmatory tests, which I will be telling you. Um, before uh, doing uh, performing the apnea test, we need to pre-oxygenate the patient with 100% FiO2 for 10 minutes. And, before, and in the meantime, while you're doing that, you need to take a pre-apnea ABG and ensure the whole committee, the whole three of you, uh, every person is uh, satisfied with the pre-apnea ABG. Then we need to disconnect the ventilator, insert a catheter through the endotracheal tube to the carina, and it will deliver oxygen at a, at a rate of uh, six liters per minute. Uh, we need to observe the chest wall for respirations, any abnormal movements, any bradycardia, any arrhythmias. And uh, we need to watch the patient and monitor the patient every minute for over 10 to 15 minutes. And then we check the ABG at the end of 10 minutes. Uh, if the PCO2 is 20 millimeters of mercury above the baseline, then we know that the apnea test is positive. Now, what I have described to you is the conventional apnea test. We, there is also a modified apnea test wherein you do not insert a catheter. Instead, you can still put the patient on CPAP uh, and uh, make sure 100% O2 is delivered and the patient can be observed or the patient can be connected to brain circuit and uh, uh, you can still do the apnea test. Now, the advantages of not uh, disconnecting the patient from the ventilator on, and veins 
is that uh, you already know that the patient is maintained with the uh, peak uh, positive end expiratory pressure and uh, sudden uh, uh, withdrawal from that uh, may cause a hemodynamic instability. So you can either go by conventional apnea testing or the modified apnea testing, whatever it is. So uh, are there signs of spontaneous breathing versus spontaneous movements versus hypoxia, bradycardia? And if the ABG does not meet the criteria for adequate PCO2 or pH stimulation, then the patient does not meet the criteria for brain death. You need to wait or you need to go in for ancillary testing. Now, uh, if the apnea test is positive, the patient meets clinical criteria for brain death. We notify the organ procurement agency immediately. In Tamil Nadu, we follow transplant guidelines through an app called VDL. That too, if the attenders agree. So when the patient meets clinical criteria for brain death, the counseling starts for the attenders of the relatives of the near and dear, and then only the organ procurement agency is notified. Uh, as I told you, contraindications to apnea testing will include arterial hypotension, hypoxemia, severe acidosis, and uh, also contraindications will be when the patient has uh, a very massive lung injury, when the patient cannot be, uh, 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 when, the, when you cannot do the apnea test on such a patient, you need to go on to ancillary or confirmatory testing. So you can do an EEG, cerebral scintigraphy, and transcranial Doppler. Uh, these uh, uh, now uh, there are neurosurgeons in uh, in my institute often are not happy because the transcranial Doppler will not give you a sufficient window because there's massive intracerebral bleed, so you will not get a sonographic window to see uh, the uh, cerebral blood flow. So what we follow is uh, cerebral angiography. If we are not able to conduct uh, apnea testing, we go in for cerebral angiography directly. So this is just a recap. Are the homeostatic factors within the normal range? No, correct them. Yes, is the patient still comatose? No, he's not. Uh, if he's not comatose, he doesn't meet the criteria for brain death. If he's comatose, does the history suggest a drug effect? Rule it out. Examine the brainstem reflexes. If they're not there, perform the apnea test either by the uh, conventional or the modified. And if there's spontaneous breathing, you know this patient doesn't qualify for brainstem death. And uh, if it's positive, you, uh, you know that the patient is uh, confirmed as a brainstem death. If there's any ambiguity in the examination or law requirement, always do not hesitate to go in for the confirmatory test. So the investigations, now we need to start investigating and uh, make sure all these uh, parameters are within the physiological range. So do a complete blood count, blood grouping and cross matching. RT-PCR we post-COVID, RT-PCR is very important. Renal function test, liver function test, thyroid function test, serum electrolytes, serum calcium is all done six hourly. ABG is done fourth hourly. We do a blood culture, endotracheal tube culture, urine culture once, PTINR six hourly, chest x ray ECG, echo, and viral markers is done once, urine routine, urine sodium, and potassium six hourly. All these investigations are done because it, most of the time, uh, the recipient uh, uh, hospitals will be repeating it again for them. So it's best we have a full, uh, uh, the battery of tests available for them to see so that the patient is not uh, exposed to multiple investigations. And regarding imaging, the chest x ray PAV is done, hepatobiliary and kidney ultrasounds are done, and non contrast enhanced abdomen and pelvis uh, CT along with the brain CT scan is done. But this is done only once, we don't do it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, in, with regards to an adult uh, donor, the apnea tests are done six hours apart. All of us know that. Uh, but I had a patient who was 17 years old, and uh, uh, actually, I went by six hours apart, and then I was pulled up by Transtan, and we had to wait for 12 hours apart. So, please, the bottom line is please understand when and uh, how uh, the, the, the time limit between the apnea tests because everything is medical legal here. You need to be very clear with that. And as I said, a three-member team certifies brainstem death and relatives are counseled by grief counselor and only after consent to proceed for the allocation procedure. Now, even though I have said that relatives are counseled by the grief counselor, we play a very major role in talking to the uh, patients. And this is where uh, a very good communication skills come into play. 
we talk to the relatives, we get to know them, we breaking bad news, everything. You know, it, I've learned so much by just sitting and talking to the uh, relatives. Uh, another thing is the time of death is only after the second apnea test or the time of cerebral angiography. And this time of death has to be explained to the uh, attenders very clearly. It can cause a lot of friction. So we need to be very cautious and we need to be very gentle and very patient when we explain this to them. And uh, as I said, we uh, proceed to the organ procurement only after the relative's consent, not before that. And uh, allocation of organs is only after HLA typing by the recipient call of hospitals. All of you know that the organs that tolerate the shortest cold ischemic time need the most HLA typing. Example, the heart and lung uh, needs uh, four to six hours. So uh, the cold ischemic time is the time between the um, aortic, uh, aortic cross clamping in the donor to the clamp release in the recipient. So that is the cold ischemic time. So organs that tolerate the shortest cold ischemic time need the most HLA typing. And uh, transesophageal echo and bronchoscopy is done by the heart lung team. Again, it's a learning curve for postgraduates and for whoever are there. You get a chance to see TE and bronchoscopy at very close our quarters. And the cross matching needs to be completed before the patient is shifted to OT. Now, the donor is shifted to the theater with transport ventilator, complete monitoring, and all supports on flow. You need to be very, very careful when the patient is being shifted. You should be very cautious and very vigilant. And uh, remember that there may be Lazarus movements because the spinal reflexes are intact, and this necessitates the use of muscle relaxants. And a point here which I would like to stress is it's very, very imperative to permit family members to pay their last respects prior to shift, give them their space, give them their time, uh, let them pay their last, last respects to their, they've lost their loved ones. So they need that space and we need to respect that. Intraoperatively, the anesthesiologist plays a major role here. You need to have a good communication between the organ retrieval and the OT staff. The anesthesiologist needs to know that the OT is ready, uh, the logistics are all there, and the, he needs to sit and talk to the retrieval team, who goes where. Each, each retrieval team works with their comfortable uh, strategy. You need to know that beforehand and hence be pre prepared. The position of the patient is fine. The warming blanket has to be placed beneath the patient. Uh, it's, it's prudent to start a wide bow peripheral line uh, if it was not placed earlier. And uh, the monitors uh, is the ECG, SPO2 and temperature. The CVP and IBP is uh, continuously monitored here through our transducers and urine output is very important. Antibiotics and steroids should be repeated if it's not given earlier. And please remember that hemodynamic disturbances are very, very common now that you have shifted into the theater. Now it's going to be a manipulation of multiple teams. You need to be very, very vigilant. So please remember uh, anesthesia here is not for the patient, but it's for attenuating the spinal reflexes. So we, we know that now, we know that we, both the motor and the autonomic spinal reflexes remain intact. And it's now exaggerated because of the loss of the descending inhibitory inputs from the brain. So the spinal reflex movements in response to noxious stimuli will be very cumbersome to the operating surgeon. So we need to be very generous in, with opioids, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, and volatiles. They are absolutely required. And uh, also be prepared for arrhythmias. As I told you, there's going to be multiple people uh, doing their job, there's going to be electrolyte uh, displacement. You need to be ready to replace electrolytes. You need to have antiarrhythmic drugs ready. You need to be ready to cardio word. You may be, be ready. You, you may need to have to be ready to do CPR because it, you need to preserve the organs. And you should be familiar with the use of IV infusion pumps and rapid infusers. So all this should be available. And the anesthesiologist inside the OT should be mentally prepared to face all this. And um, the incision, the, the liver transplant, uh, the liver, liver retrieval team starts first. So it's a midline incision uh, uh, from the suprasternal notch to the suprapubis 
of which the abdominal surgeon starts first. So uh, he starts with the liver because it has multiple ligaments. So he, he goes around dissecting all the ligaments and uh, uh, the hepatoesophageal ligament, uh, when it is divided, the iota around the diaphragm is dissected. And when that part is over, the cardiothoracic team starts their dissection. Now this can take anywhere between an hour, one hour to one and a half hours. So uh, it will take, uh, the, the, the liver retrieval team will take the most time. Uh, as the uh, cardiothoracic surgeon comes into uh, play, we have need, they will ask for heparin 300 international units per kg prior to aortic cannulation. And uh, cardioplegic solution is also given before dissection of the heart. And uh, they will be using a lot of perfusates, uh, HTK 20 ml per kg for the heart and Perfidex 70 ml per kg for the lung. And uh, ice slush is used to fill the abdomen. Uh, during lung dissection, Valsalva will be, uh, is required to inflate the lungs and ABG needs to be repeated. Now, even though I have cut short this, there will be times, as I told you, the cold ischemia time for the heart and lung is uh, reduced. So the recipient has to be simultaneously prepared in the, in the, in the hospital. So the, the main time delay will be by the cardiothoracic surgeons because they do not want the cold ischemia time to be prolonged. So you can anticipate a prolonged time delay here, especially in this uh, point. Then the organs rem removed are in the order of heart and lung, liver, small bowel pancreas, and kidneys comes last, uh, kidneys, followed by the cornea at the end. The perfusate for the liver is the HTK solution. All organs are transported using the three bag technique. So the organ is uh, put into the first bag with 1000 ml of perfusate, it's tied. Now that is put into the second bag with one liter of cold NS or slush ice. And it's put into a third bag. Uh, and the entire third bag is placed in a heat preservation box with ice for transportation. Now, this is very important. Organs are transported safely to the recipient. Uh, hospital. Now, there are many medical, medical legal issues surrounding organ retrieval, uh, we're mainly because of the time of death. And uh, the, the, the attenders might not uh, understand uh, the time of death. So you really have to sit and talk to them and make sure all the forms are uh, appropriately signed and uh, kept ready. And uh, there's always medical legal issues. When you have an unknown patient with uh, brainstem dysfunction, uh, you really need to uh, understand whether to proceed or not. And uh, non-trauma patients with brainstem dysfunction, do we do a postmortem or not? In all traumatic patients, we do do a postmortem. In non-trauma patients with brainstem dysfunction, again, it has to be discussed. And the eligibility criteria for organ retrieval in patients with long-standing comorbidities especially uh, uh, geriatric donors, uh, you, we, would have, uh, uh, we would have spent a long time in maintaining these patients. And uh, if there's not going to be any takers, then it's, it, it'll be a massive waste. So you really have to talk with the Transdan Organ Procuring uh, Agency and see if, they're going, is they're going, if there, is, there will be any organs or takers for these organs. And again, HIV, HPV, and HCV positive donors, you need to have a separate space for them. Uh, so make sure you have separate spaces for these donors uh, because there, was all, there will always be a recipient waiting. So uh, as far as all these medical legal issues are concerned, our forensic uh, team comes into the spotlight here and they help us uh, with all these, especially the unknown patients in brainstem dysfunction. And... Uh, It, it comes a full circle, you know, the, we, our job doesn't end after apnea testing or after shifting the patient to theater or after all the organ is retrieved. It doesn't stop there. You need to complete the circle, complete the spectrum. You need to pay final respects. And uh, on the left, that is our head of our institute. Uh, you can see him, he will always be there to pay his final respects. And uh, on the right is myself, that was done on a Sunday, it was very late. So uh, I had to stay back, talk to the attenders and pay our final respects. So 
this is very important and uh, i hope all of us learn i think this is the this is a very important learning uh, process which all of us have to learn and have to practice and uh, end point no uh, this was the first heart transplant done at rgdh since the start of pandemic and uh, i haven't seen this patient but uh, this uh, this article when i saw it when i opened the uh, newspaper early morning when i saw it it gave so much of gratification because you know you had maintained the patient the donor so well that the recipient is actually sitting up there and smiling and it's extremely gratifying to the entire team uh, who's behind the screens here so and uh, uh, organ uh, retrieval and uh, maintenance of these patients it needs an enormous commitment and uh, human strength and courage and if you are able to do this uh, i think uh, it's it's an enormous learning curve and that is what i tell all my post graduates there is so much to learn here and uh, if you do it with a lot of uh, commitment there's a lot of uh, peace at the end so uh, these are my references uh, thank you very much for this very patient listening and uh, i'm ready to take any questions if there are thank you thank you madam thank you it was a wonderful lecture and a very valuable points and a, a very practical points too uh, and, uh, i have some questions like um, yeah. you you emphasized more about the concern uh, for the organ uh, the donor yeah now who has to, who has to give the consent is there any legal issues in that oh uh, yes oh yes the consent has to be given by the blood relatives uh, if the uh, by the wife many times there are two wives we have to call both the wives the parents it's always the blood relatives we have the uh, we have the whole family uh, it's very important even if one of them says no we do not proceed even though in my institute we get around 10 to 12 road traffic accidents every day uh, we do not proceed if there is not consent so it's imperative the whole family sits with me and says okay we would like to proceed yeah it has to be from the father uh, you told about multiple ways of process uh, yeah. in, so what, what what is your guideline to that so what to be started yeah, we, first and what should be avoided yeah i we, we start with dopamine and i start and noradrenaline and vasopressin if these three are started early enough along with uh, good uh, temperature maintenance there is absolutely no need to go into for adrenaline or any other uh, drug you know start the dopamine vasopressin and norad very early it's 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 uh, you will be i have noticed that you need not have to go into the higher range of dosages at all so it's dopamine 10 mics per kg norad mm, then vasopressin would be 0.03 units per minute after that uh, one unit uh, bolus so you you the, the you need to have a very good uh, rapport with the neurosurgeons and the neuro uh, neurologists so as soon as they tell you that this patient is an e1 dt m1 going in for brain stem death you need to start acting there itself you need to start acting at the zero tau when you start doing that uh, you need not uh, going to the other inotropes at all so it's dopamine noradrenaline and vasopressin uh, to keep the urine output high is there any role of uh, uh, diuretics here this uh... Donor uh, no the patient has a diabetes insipidus so there will be a massive outpour of urine no so we don't use a diuretics we only keep a tab on the central venous pressure make sure we do not overload the patient so we are more worried about overloading the patient only when you think the patient is going going in for pulmonary edema do you use a diuretic but i have never used a diuretic uh, i think we are 22 uh, organ retrievers old since uh, december 2020 and uh, no we haven't uh, used diuretics uh, how much cardiac index uh, you have we have to maintain the organ donor how much cardiac cardiac index uh okay uh, i 
I do not have a cardiac index, but it's 2.4. We will maintain the CVP at around 8 to 12. So, and again, your cardiac index depends on how good the heart is performing. You need to do an echo. You need to make sure the heart is functioning well. So the cardiac index will vary. There's no clear-cut strategy uh, for any patient. You know, it, it, it changes. So I, I uh, normally go by the CVP. So it's 8 to 12 uh, centimeters, I mean, millimeters. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from a post -graduate. Can mean arterial pressure be maintained more than 90 before apnea has to be done with inotropic support? Pardon me, I didn't get it. No, mean arterial pressure of more than 90. Can we maintain mean arterial pressure of more than 90 before? Oh, no, that's easier said than done, sir. If you have a mean arterial pressure of 90, you're lucky. <laughs> you're very lucky. Right. Because on day one, it'll be 90. The day two, it'll be 80. Day three, it'll be 60. 70, it'll keep on decreasing. If you have a map of 90, that's that's really good. But it's like a, it's like a cricket match. You know, it, it varies and you have to be there. You have to maintain it. You are really lucky if things move fast in the mean in map is at 90. The dynamics change very, very fast. Okay. Uh, uh, how long we can wait after, uh, so you told two apnea tests in yeah. service interval. So after the second apnea test, uh, is there anything we have to wait or we can take a go ahead with the consent? No, everything is as fine. I told you, I, I did I did organ retrieval on a patient five days after our apnea test was declared. So they were in their own, uh, like they, they were in denial for a long time. They did not want us to disconnect the patient from the ventilator. So it actually took five days for us and five days of uh, agony because one day the patient would maintain well, the other day he'd come crashing down. So it was, uh, it, it, we have maintained for five days. So after the first and second apnea test, you can wait. But again, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And another the, thing I wanted to tell you is, all these criteria stands, holds good only for the first apnea test. After six hours, the PCO2 and the bicarb, I mean, uh, the, the potassium might not be within the normal limits as you think. So it's very difficult even after those six hours to maintain the absolute criteria which held good for the first apnea test. Uh, Madam, uh, in your experience, so what you have found it as an obstacle for this uh, organ retrieval uh, program? Us. Uh, 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 what are the obstacles which you have yeah. faced? Obstacles are us. Because many people, many people, uh, I are not very interested in doing an organ retrieval because then you have to be at the hospital 24 into 7. Now, when I say uh, I, I, am, I am heading organ retrieval along with my team of a nephrologist and an anesthetist, all three of us are available 24 into 7 whenever the, pa the patient attender wants us or whenever the BP comes crashing down. So we need to be available. So that is what I felt was the greatest obstacle. For example, if the, the three member team, if all three of us are not there, then the program doesn't really run. So that are, I think that is the greatest obstacle, nothing else. The rest will fall in. If we have like-minded people, the whole program runs well. Thank you, madam, thank you. Uh, Edward, sir, do you have any other questions, sir? Uh, yes, sir, the, regarding the cardiac index, even though they say the cardiac index should be more than 2.4, and a left ventricular ejection fraction more than 45, and urine output and uolivia. So everything, the most important is the mixed venous saturation of pulmonary artery should be 70. That determines the organ perfusion. Thank you. Okay, so shall we move on to the next topic? Please? Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Thank madam. Uh, so we'll go ahead with the uh, next uh, session. Um, very interesting anesthesia for uh, renal transplant and uh, uh, it will be done by Dr. Anil Kumar Sharma who is a senior consultant uh, uh, from Apollo Hospital uh, New Delhi. Um, he is having uh, enormous interest over robotic surgery, renal transplant uh, surgeries and anesthesia and uh, he is a faculty in many national state conferences, uh, CMEs and uh, workshops and those who uh, do uh, learning from Facebook, you would have uh, seen him very frequently and actively in the B Anesthetic Society group. 
and uh, he's a, a wonderful wonderful teacher and who keeps always the discussions very 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 alive and very lucky to have him here today welcome you sir uh, over to you sir and come on sir thank you uh okay uh so let me share the screen first and uh, first of all i want to thank the organizers uh, it's a real privilege uh, i think many of you might not be knowing i did my mbbs from uh, tamil nadu tanjore uh, 93 batch uh, uh, i am a converted tamilian uh, to be very honest and uh, with that i would st- like to start my lecture and uh, it's a real pleasure to be there uh, okay so anesthesia for kidney transplant so uh, um, dear colleagues today uh, you will not only learn the kidney transplant but you will do it with me uh, online and i will make it very practical uh, as far as teaching anything uh, on any topic is concerned i think google is the best teacher so i will try to tell you what we do so i am coming uh, from a center indraprastha apollo hospital delhi we do around 800 to 900 kidney transplants in a year uh i have been there as a consultant in uh, since 2011 i started in 2008 as a kidney transplant anesthetist i am really thankful to dr rajesh alawat who is the chairman uh, kidney transplant uh, at medanta he is a surgeon it's a real privilege uh, to have him as my mentor he is the person a surgeon teaching an anesthetist the trans nuances of a transplant anesthesia the renal transplants so uh, let's starts with the basics what is a kidney transplant so kidney transplant is the organ transplant of a kidney into a patient with end stage renal disease so it's a surgical procedure in which a healthy kidney a functioning kidney is removed from a donor and implanted into a patient with non functioning kidneys let us keep it very simple so how did it all start it all started in 1954 when gil detol performed the first successful renal transplant Excuse me, your slides are not uh, being displayed. Can Sorry, you your your slides slides are not able. You are not seeing your slides. Just just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Uh, I don't know why this is happening. Wait, wait. Let me check again. Give me time. Sir, please share the PPT. Uh, I did. I think uh, I will just check again. Uh, is it coming now? Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. It's coming. Okay, maybe uh, because of the previous thing. Uh, okay, so is it okay now? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. fine. Uh, so, as, uh, yeah. So, uh, this is my hospital, and uh, therein where we perform eight hundred to nine hundred kidney transplants in a year. And he is my mentor, uh, Dr. Rajesh Shalawat, uh, very renowned uh, transplant surgeon in Delhi. and i learned uh, my anesthesia from my surgeon basically so as i told you kidney transplant is basically organ transplant of a kidney into a patient with end stage renal disease it's a surgical procedure in which a healthy kidney is removed a functioning kidney is removed from a donor and implanted into a patient with non functioning kidney so it all started in 1954 when gil detol performed the first successful renal transplant it was done on identical twins the monitors were very simple and you will not believe that the recipient actually received a spinal anesthesia but after that there were advances in immunosuppression and the introduction of atg changed a, uh, a lot of things and development of organ preservation solution by collins enabled the use of allografts so before going into the uh, nuances of the transplant we need to understand what is uh, basically the role of an anesthesiologist for that matter in any surgery i firmly believe that the role of an anesthesiologist is to maintain the physiology of the patient by his knowledge of pharmacology while the surgery is going on so we need to have a thorough knowledge of the physiology and what are the physiological changes that occur in a particular surgery so understanding the metabolic and systemic abnormalities of end stage renal disease is important as these patients have many associated comorbid conditions and this increases the complexity of anesthesia pain management and perioperative morbidity and mortality is influenced by all these comorbidities so what we require is a good multidisciplinary approach while approaching the patients uh, for kidney transplants so after progression to end stage kidney disease kidney transplant is the treatment of choice it's the most commonly performed organ transplant and compared with maintenance dialysis 
so successful transplant improves quality of life and reduces mortality risk this question will be frequently asked by the patients and the relatives oh sir shall we continue on dialysis or whether you need to go for a transplant if there is end stage renal disease ckd5 then all patients suffering from ckd5 should undergo renal transplant unless absolutely contraindicated so vis a vis dialysis versus transplant yes kidney transplant is the most important cost effective method of treating end stage renal disease it confers a 40 to 60% decrease in death rate as compared with patients who remain on dialysis and as is clear is in this uh, graph on dialysis you can see the survival and after live donor uh, transplant the uh, recipients tend to live longer so what are the common etiologies we all know diabetes cgn polycystic kidney disease hypertension interstitial nephritis these are the some of the common etiologies of renal diseases so who is a candidate for a kidney transplant if the estimated gfr is less than 20 ml then definitely he is a candidate for renal transplant the rate of progression to esrd is important as, as we all know if the page, the etiology is diabetes the renal failure can develop very rapidly if it is obvious that patient will eventually require dialysis the transplant is practical and a very cost effective option but there are certain barriers to receive a kidney so what are these barriers if there is any life threatening infection active malignancy unstable cardiovascular disease or any behavior abnormality that would result in non adherence to immunosuppressive regimens or old is no longer a contraindication to transplant let me be very clear you can see we transplanted a kidney in 82 year old and just to inform you yes it was a very successful surgery so the donors uh, need to be classified on the source of organ basically they can be deceased or they can be living the disease are further classified into brain stem dead and heart beating or a non heart beating the living donors are classified as related and unrelated unrelated there can be an emotional connection or no emotional connection purely altruistic paired or pooled i will elaborate on each one of them so what is the advantage of having a living donor versus deceased donor so transplantation of a living donor kidney is an elective surgery surgical procedure so potential recipients are evaluated at a pre op stage and optimized so this is one advantage which we have when we are dealing with living donors so what happens in a diseased uh, deceased donor the transplantation of a deceased donor is a relatively urgent procedure we don't have time suddenly we get an organ from some hospital maybe it may not be in house and so what misses what we miss out is preoperative reevaluation it is a very fast forwarded procedure as the organ uh, longevity or the organ pool dystemia time is at stake so what about donation after circulatory death yes it does increase the number of organs available the but the uh, side effect or the in the hindsight we do have a problem that it has a 5.73 fold increase in the incidence of delayed graft function so higher primary non function rate compared to donation after brain death right so this is the graft survival obviously in a comparison between living donor versus deceased uh, donor you can see uh, the difference so as i told you what are the advantages the advantage is that living donation by increasing the donor pool increases the organs available for the transplant it's an elective procedure and we can have flexible timings complete preemptive renal transplants are however still the exception they are not the normal and recipients have usually been started either on some form of renal replacement therapy uh, before we go in for the uh, live donation and live transplants so it has higher success rate a thorough assessment is done psychiatric evaluation of donor's motivation is done his fitness is done and tested and his ability to understand the risk of operation is also explained to him so we need to match the abo and hla matching is the initial criteria of any donor selection so what is pair donor see you must have heard kidney swap that is how the loosely that term is so one incompatible donor candidate pair is matched to another pair with a complementary incompatibility so donor from one pair gives an organ to a compatible candidate in the other pair and vice versa so this is the i think this slides makes it very clear so in a pair donation uh, you will have a swap between one pair so the donor to recipient 
donor one to recipient two, donor two to recipient one. But in a pool donation, it's like a pool. The donor of one might be giving to recipient two, the donor of two might be giving to recipient three. And in the literature, you will be surprised, 70 such pooled donations have happened for one transplant. Uh, that is what I could found out in literature. Okay, so what are the indications of kidney pair donors when there is a blood group incompatibility? The issues of sensitization of recipients against the donor, or if there is a potential for improvement in transplant quality, for example, difference in age or graft size, or where the, there is a difference in tissue compatibility. So what excludes you from donating kidney? So exclusion criteria is uncontrolled high blood pressure, severe diabetes, malignancy, HIV, hepatitis, active acute infections, and a serious mental health conditions. So these are some of the exclusion criteria for donating a kidney. And then there are definitely ethical in issues involved. Potential donors are carefully evaluated, both psychologically and medically. Their fully informed consent is taken. They must provide an evidence of a familial or long-term relationship. Nowadays, after an amendment in 2014, altruistic donation is allowed, but it is still limited. So decision must be specifically approved by a panel. So this is how we do it to make uh, fail proof. You might have heard that uh, uh, there is a lot of hanky panky going on in kidney transplants. The donors are chosen random, randomly. So to uh, prevent all this, uh, the biometrics of the donors is done in our center. And uh, along with the photograph, the thumb impression, what is fed in the computer at the time of panel clearance is fed in the central computer. And when the patient comes to the OT complex reception, the final clearance is done by the biometrics. So no donor can be interchanged or there cannot be any fudging. So this is how we do it. There is a lab verification, then there is a registration, and then there's a form verification and the counseling is done. After the panel authorizes us, then the patient comes to our operation theater. And finally, there is when the biometrics clearance is given and the donor is taken in. So this is a virtual foolproof method of ensuring that there is no hanky-panky in the kidney transplants at at least our, our center. So donor's uh, nephrectomy is a major surgical procedure and definitely it puts the patient at risk of morbidity and mortality. See, donors are not patients. We make them patients. Let, let us be very clear on this. So donors who have su successfully completed the evaluation for living kidney donation have been found to have an above average life expectancy. So let's come to the anesthesia part of management uh, of living donor nephrectomy since it's the most commonly performed uh, procedure for a, a kidney transplant. Majority of the donors are mostly ASA 1 and 2. Still, a full preoperative assessment is required to know the uh, renal function and this is mandatory. What are complicated donors if they are older, say 70 and above, with some comorbidities, if they are obese, BMI more than 30, if certain donors refuse blood products or have vascular abnormalities, or they require to have a right surgical nephrectomy, mind it, right surgical nephrectomy is more challenging surgically. So a thorough PAC is done. This is our PAC chart wherein everything is documented right from the latest investigations to any known medical conditions. And then uh, once we see that the PAC is done, PAC is fit, then we take the donor for the surgery. Hypertension is always uh, like a gray area, but it's no longer a contraindication as long as uh, the kidney functions and urine proteins are normal. A prospective donor may be on treatment for hypertension. And if it is well controlled, like diastolic less than 85, then he is a candidate for a donor nephrectomy but they should be warned of the possibility that the nephrectomy may worsen the hypertension. So what are the techniques available? Open surgery, laparoscopic, and robotic. At our centers, all three are performed. There is one surgeon who does only open donor nephrectomies. There is one surgeon who does only laparoscopic donor nephrectomies. And then robotic was also tried. So what are the advantages of a laparoscopic live donor nephrectomy? Obviously, it reduces blood loss, decreases tissue trauma, there's less analgesic requirement, faster resumption of food intake, shorter hospitalization, and better post-operative cosmetic appearance. 
general anesthesia is the only practical option for laparoscopic live donor nephrectomy as it involves a pneumoperitoneum and a head down position. Robotic donor nephrectomies have been tried. Definitely a three-dimensional vision enhances the ability of surgeon to perform complex tasks and it has definitely increased in popularity also. In some centers, it has replaced open donor nephrectomy as the standard technique. So donors are at moderate risk for development of venous thromboembolism. So we put up mechanical stockings. Uh, generous venous excess is a must as blood loss. If it occurs, it's really profuse. Special attention should be paid to, to the prevention of complications related to near full lateral position, especially nerve damage, airway compromise, and venous excess compromise. You can see in this position, this is the uh, position for the uh, kidney donor, right? You can see how complicated it is. And this is the view from the front. So everything is carefully padded and protected. You can see the face, you can see the legs, there is a mechanical compression stockings and whatever said and done, all the belts and then I still want my patient to be strapped with leukoplast. This is a practical tip that I want to give. The belts can come off, but not your leukoplast. This 20 rupees or 30 rupees thing still holds the fort for me, even in Apollo hospital. So these are the mechanical compression stockings. These are very important. So this is the final position and you can see what we are dealing with. So induction is normal. We use propo and this is at my center. See anesthesia is a cafeteria choice. Many of you must be using a different regimen. Ultimately, what is important is the safety of the patient, what, whatever regimen we use. At my center, we use propofol fentanyl atracurium. Uh, atracurium in doses of one mic, uh, uh, one, uh, mic per kg, one milligram per kg. Uh, for the patient. The maintenance is oxygen, air, sevoflurane. Yes, we use sevoflurane. Uh, you can use desflurane also. Morphine is used and atracurium is used for maintenance. Fluid, around three liters of crystalloids. We give one liter fast. You can preload also, fol followed by one gram per kg of mannitol before clipping of renal vessels. So what is the thing? The thing is high urine output, at least more than two ml per kg per hour, at least more than. So patient is catheterized and a Euroflow meter is used. After the ureter is clamped, it is very important that the Euro bag is emptied and as after that, it's the single kidney urine output that needs to be measured. So this is the laparoscopy uh, donor uh, nephrectomy going on at my place and you can see the uh, vascular pedicle being clamped. So I will go and I will demonstrate, as I told you, today you will be performing these surgeries also, uh, besides giving anesthesia online. So I have taken an animation video wherein I can show how this surgery is performed. See, an anesthetist in his theater is respected not for his knowledge of anesthesia by the surgeon. An anesthetist is respected in the OT if he knows what the surgeon is doing for his surgery and is in sync with the different steps of the surgery that the surgeon is performing. So it's imperative that besides you know your part of the anesthesia, you know the surgical steps also. So I am telling you what are the surgical steps in the donor nephrectomy. Just a minute. So a three port uh, after the positioning is done, the three ports uh, are placed. And the kidney is mobilized. So once the kidney is approached, what we do is that we do identify the gonadal vein and the ureter. This is the gonadal vein and the ureter being identified. This is the gonadal vein. And then we uh, identify the adrenal vein. So once this identification is done, immediately we clip the, uh, all the accessory uh, uh, veins. Then the gonadal vein is identified and clipped. and cut so the adrenals are separated and then we pay attention to the uh, main pedicle so the renal vein is freed and checked 
so renal artery is also freed from the nearby structure and checked so once we are clear with the pedicle we go back to our ureter which is clamped at an appropriate length and the gonadal vein is also clamped and cut and a bikini incision is made for the retrieval of the kidney and through this once it's done then we come to the main renal artery it's clamped first hemolog clips are used then the renal artery is divided and using a stapler then the renal vein is cut off and through this incision the kidney is removed and transferred to the bowl containing the crushed ice and then the ports are removed after checking for bleeding and the incision is closed so this is how we do the uh, surgery basically right so both lap and open uh, are done in lateral position the risk of diaphragmatic injury is more in open so post op chest x ray is a must whatever happens you have to order a chest x ray if you are doing an open donor nephrectomy in lap a 5 cm incision is given as i showed you uh, to retrieve the harvested kidney after kidney is removed by the surgeon it is flushed with ice cold custodial solution uh, earlier we were using uw solutions but we have stopped it now and this uh, as madam also told it's kept in an organ bag in crushed ice till it's transplanted so the this is the incision and the, that is how uh, it's done and then it's closed this is the custodial solution being used i told you i will show you everything practical what happens in ot this is how this uh, is made ready before the kidney is to come out as an anesthetist we have to ensure that please understand this this is not a nursing job this is a team job and anesthetist is the leader of the team so before everything starts we need to know whether we have crushed ties we have our custodial ready and everything is okay and working so you need to liaison with the staff nurse this is the setup for the uh, perfusion fluid and this is how we do it so perfusion fluid after the kidney is harvested this is the perfusion fluid and this is going into the uh, harvested kidney until it starts coming out it's the complete perfusion fluid will go in for preservation and the kidney is in the bowl and you can see uh, it's in the crushed ice so what is warm and cold ischemia time and why they are important warm ischemia time is time from renal artery ligation to flushing of the harvested kidney with preservation solution i will come again on this once you clamp the renal artery and once uh, till the time your uh, harvested kidney is uh, flushed with preservation solution this is warm ischemia time try to keep it as minimum as possible normally 3 minutes maybe uh, or maximum 5 minutes maybe more, even less than that right after that starts the cold ischemia time so what is cold ischemia time till the harvested kidney which was flushed with cold uh, preservative solution it is retransplanted in the recipient and the renal artery is reperfused right so these are important and they should be documented so what how we preserve the kidney basically preservation solutions are used and what are these solutions they have the composition which is very similar to intracellular environment thus preventing loss of cellular potassium so the organ preserving cold storage interval is called cold ischemia time and kidneys have a cit of over 24 hours so kidneys from living donors are easier to handle the organ is flushed with preservative solution the ischemic time mostly is normally if you have planned the surgery it is around 20 to 30 minutes and because of this lower uh, cold ischemia time and improvement in immunosuppression the improvements in graft function and survival have taken place so post operative pain 
this is a very common question that i uh, face from the audience wherever i present see it's a painful pro procedure no doubt you, even if it's a laparoscopic or open the uh, subcostal wound is often 10 to 12 cm in length and this does make breathing painful. In lab donor, the pain is due to a combination of port pain, pelvic organ nociception, diaphragmatic ir irritation, ureterocolic, and urinary catheter discomfort. So these group of patients will require PCA with fentanyl. So we can decrease the opiate consumption by topical local anesthetic. This is very important. So initially surgeons were reluctant, so I took it on myself. I will just put on my gloves and infiltrate the uh, um, this incision basically. Yes, you can use a paravertebral or tab block. An indwelling catheter in the wound site delivering local anesthetic infusion can also be used. Up to 5% of donors might uh, experiencing uh, chronic wound pain. So all patients as a rule, they go to post-op surgical donor ICU for post-op care for at least 24 to 48 hours. This is a standard procedure in our hospital. Yes, there can be complications like pneumonia, pulmonary atelectasis, but they are uh, very minor complications, mostly limited to say 5% or 7% of the patient or maybe even less. So we need to counsel the patient that what we have seen, transient increase in serum creatinine level, which uh, uh, is there seen on first POD. These parameters usually return to normal within one month. 20 to 30% of the patients might develop some sort of uh, proteinuria, but again, this set, uh, settles down. Long-term renal function remains at 75% for the donor, but there is no convincing evidence that there is increased risk of hypertension in donor after donor nephrectomies. Surgical complications do occur, but only 1% to 2% are significant, which might result in delay in patient discharge from hospital. This is very important. Donor death is not acceptable. Donor death means end of the program. Let me make one thing very clear. So risk of perioperative mortality is there. It should be explained to the patient. It is comparable to the risk of dying in road traffic accident. Common causes can be pulmonary embolism, MI, infections or arrhythmias, but no, no donor mortalities in live donor nephrectomies, uh, nephrectomies are acceptable. So coming to anesthesia for kidney recipient, as I told you, we need to know about the physiology of the things. Kidneys are essential for adjusting body fluids. We all know electrolyte composition, base balance, hemoglobin concentration. They receive about 25% of the cardiac output. So we are. it's very important that we know about the cardiovascular abnormalities in patients, which we will be taking for uh, renal as renal recipients. Hypertension, cardiomyopathy are very common. Uribic cardiomyopathy is there. Don't be panicky. This is entirely reversible. Don't delay the transplant just because a patient is having cardiomyopathy. Liaison with your cardiologist. Optimize the patient, but don't stress too much. You have to believe me, we have gone down to patients whose ejection fraction was 12% and they are very much alive and walking and God has been kind to us. So the goal is to achieve a blood pressure of around 130-85. Occasionally, this, this uremic pericarditis can be hemorrhagic type in these patients. So hematological system is affected. We all know they, they will be having an HP of five to seven. Um, our baseline is seven. We have gone down to five also. So pulmonary effects will be there. Intraperitoneal fluid can result in splinting and basal atelectasis can be seen. But again, don't cancel these cases for that. This might be their last chance and this transplant is their cure. So. We are very much concerned about the potassium levels here. Yes, so what happens is that potassium levels of up to 5.5 uh, we have accepted. Um, uh, more than that, the patient needs to be dialyzed. So endocrine system is also affected. There can be se secondary hyperparathyroidism. Yes, PT and PTT remain normal, but bleeding time is prolonged. This is because of the platelet dysfunction. We should know about the dialysis disequilibrium and uh, there can be changes in ECF volume. Dementia is seen in patients on long-term dialysis. So there are certain problems of dialysis. It can result in long-term uh, uh, like infections are seen, hepatitis, HIV, leukopenia, then care of AV fistula is, uh, if it's not taken care of, then can lead to local gangrene. Peritoneal dialysis can also lead to peritonitis and subacute intestinal obstructions. 
so immunosuppression we need to know what our patient is taking and uh, it started in the pre op phase it's usually divided in three phases the first phase is induction therapy uh, and it involves marked immunosuppression induction agents like uh, atg uh, bacilizumab it comes by the name of simulect is used certain newer agents have also come like alifacept so the second phase is maintenance uh, involves continuously for 3 to 6 month to prevent acute graft rejection and in that tacrolimus and azt are given the third phase involves long term you know suppression and it's maintained for rest of the life so dialysis is a very gray area whether you want to do it whether you don't want to do it if possible dialysis should be avoided for 24 hours prior to kidney trans transplant and the target weight after the dialysis is within the 2 kg Uh, of the dry weight of the patient so if the hemodialysis is necessary you try to use heparin free dialysis and if it is heparin has been used wait for 3 to 4 hours the ptt should be less than 45 so what happens in non dialysing patients uh, who are awaiting um, kidney transplant they are not on dialysis so suspect hyperkalemia and volume overload in these patients mostly these are the patients who will come suddenly when uh, a deceased donor uh, organ is available so when in doubt dialyze don't hesitate to dialyze right hyperkalemia don't delay up to 5.5 you can take uh, more than that i will advise dialysis frankly but if it's an emergency medically manage the, the hyperkalemia part and don't delay the surgery for dialysis so what you do for volume overload obviously you go for dialysis if the dialysis uh, is not available try to use iv loop diuretics to reduce the volume overload so we need to have a risk stratification done for this uh, recipient uh, this is a chart you can get it on google i will not elaborate how i do it i will show you in the next slide after assessing the comorbidities a dsc is must at our center we go for dsc and uh, then accordingly uh, we evaluate the patient ecg and echocardiogram tmt are must so this is what i was telling you how i stratify the patients i stratify these patients on left ventricular ejection fraction above 50% treat them as normal no great concerns between 30 to 50% be very very alert less than 30% everything is in your hand right no fluids uh, before the uh, reperfusion is done and we see that the urine is actually coming from the transplanted kidney in this last subset mostly your patients will fall in this middle category of ef of 30 to 50% as i told you at my center we have gone down to patients uh, who had ejection fraction around 10 to 15% also but that comes with the time right so don't hesitate to take this patient after explaining the risk but this is how i do it or how we do it at our center so over zealous air ultra filtration is avoided anti hypertensive drugs should be continued until the time of surgery oral hypoglycemics as we all know are withheld and if at all you want to use insulin use sliding scale insulin regimen uh, insulin regimen antibiotic pro prophylaxis is used this is very important induction of immunosuppression should be started before entering the operation theater it's very important that uh, this is not started when the, your patient is under anesthesia because of the cytokine storm that can happen and everything can go haywire if it is started in drop and you might have to abandon the surgery so it needs to be carefully planned with your surgeon and the nephrologist before your patient will is wheeled in into your theater so all the routine lab tests are done evaluation of cardiac function is of central importance as i uh, mentioned in my previous uh, slides so routinely we do cross match uh, two units of prc and since uh, significant blood loss is a possibility uh, it but it is kept in the blood bank only it's not issued it's not never inside ot so a comprehensive workup is done and everything is documented including the fistula uh, what and uh, instruction though we all know avoid cannulation in that particular arm where there is a fistula any universal precaution is documented what is the dsc done it's documented what is the blood group it is highlighted right so a comprehensive psc is done and documented post dialysis investigations are must and they should be taken care of and noted down immediately once the patient is in the pre op area 
especially the PT, PTT should be there if the patient has come from the dialysis. And also the electrolyte and the creatinine status. So how do we manage them intraoperatively? So we use a balanced general anesthesia to provide stable hemodynamics uh, with muscle relaxation and a predictable depth of anesthesia. So the status of hemodynamic shunt or fistula should be monitored during positioning. It needs to be covered with soft GMG rolls and great care should be taken while transferring these patients as they are prone to fractures. So this is how we do it. This fistula is taped and tagged and padded and documented. Standard monitors are applied. Uh, at our centers, uh, we do uh, put in arterial cannula, CVP monitoring is continuously done. So now, as I told you, you will be conducting a kidney transplant recipient with me in the further slides. So this is the patient. This is how the monitor will look like once you attach the monitor to a recipient. Don't panic. This is, yes, the systolic, this belongs to an actual patient, right? This is the mean pressure. You can see the saturation. I will just highlight. I think, uh, yeah, so it's clear. This will be something which you will see on the monitor after attaching the monitors on a recipient. You pre-oxygenate, you bring it to 100. Yes, this is the BP, you induce the patient. So what you do, you titrate your propofol. You don't use etomidate blindly for all, okay? Titrate your propofol, it's a wonderful drug. Short-acting beta blockers can be used and short-acting is important here. Opioids use fentanyl, Rami, it's not available here. Scoline is not theoretically safe. We avoid at our center. We induce with uh, propofol, atracurium, and fentanyl, right? As I told you, titrate the dose. Propofol can be reduced, uh, used in reduced doses. So prior to induction, a large bore peripheral IV is a must if you, if you will be able to get it. I will come to the IV lines later. So following the induction of anesthesia, what we do is a triple lumen center line is uh, taken, a Foley's catheter is inserted, fluids are infused liberally to the center line and IV line if the ejection fraction criteria are met. We routinely put arterial line and I will advise you to put it for simple reason. It gives you a lot of peace of mind. You can be uh, doing ABGs frequently to see whether the patient is in acidosis or not, or to see the hemodynamics if uh, the patient goes unstable during the surgery. So this arterial line is put. Yes, venous excess. So we have done at our centers, a venous excess in these patients are very complicated. We have seen patients who are, all the four uh, neck veins are blocked, both the IJVs are blocked, both the subclavians are blocked. You cannot do anything. Um, on the one hand, there will be a fistula. You can't use that hand. Uh, femoral, you can't use because one side will be the transplant, the other side the surgeon wants free. So we have done it in simply 16 days. We have put 8.5 French. Yes, this is important. Normal center lines are seven French. If you don't have any excess, go for an 8.5 French because that gives an access to two uh, 16 gauge and one 14 gauge port, right? We have used pick line. We, are, uh, we do a USG guided color Doppler pre-op to know what is the status of the veins. Existing permacath can be used and should be used, right? Venous excess in these patients are at premium. Don't go with surgeon's opinion that, oh, oh uh, we, can, we have to remove this. This is a source of infection. No, it can't be a source of infection. If you can have a dialysis two hours before from the permacath, it is as good for me to use it in drop. As simple as that. No compromise on this. There is, what is the alternative to arterial line if you don't get it? Simply ask your surgeon. He is having all the vessels in front of you. He can take a trial to uh, CC syringe. Ask him to uh, provide you an ABG if you're not uh, able to secure an art line. So don't panic. This is how you troubleshoot. Okay. So can you imagine this is in the popliteal fossa that we got, uh, got an IV access? Yes, we conducted the transplant here from the uh, IV access here. Then this is an EJV only uh, transplant, uh, a 16 gauge cannula, which we did. There was no other venous access. So this is the patient's permacath, which we are using. So put a central line, whatever access you are having, don't panic. Yes, it can be done and it can be done safely. Use an ultrasound. You can see uh, a preemptive ultrasound tells you whether there is a clot in the veins because these uh, lines are being used for dialysis. Confirm your lines, confirm your uh, guide wires before you thread in the lines in these patients. 
So maintenance, we, uh, we use atracurium, oxygen, air, CO fluorine. Personally, I use, I don't use desfluorine and CO fluorine is very safe. Introp, solumedrol, mannitol, lessix and clexane is required. So this is how, as I told you, you should know uh, what are the steps of the surgery. So how do we know when the vein is being done, right? Yes, I tell you, you, you should know what are the surgical steps so when when a single thread is being used by your surgeon he is doing the vein rule of thumb okay he will be using a simple single thread and then coming to the artery part of it when he is using multiple arteries uh, multiple threads that means he is on his artery so this is how you know what is the step going on without disturbing your surgeon right now this is very important how do you manage this hypertension? Yes, it can just shoot up in drop. So how I do is, you can see this is a mean of 130. Yes, this is definitely high. Now what I do is that my monitor is split in a 30 minute scale, right? You can see what I've done. When my BP shoots up, I normally use oxygen air mixture. When I my BP shoots up for the patient, I use nitrous, right? So the moment I use nitrous, you can see this graph is coming up. My BP starts settling down. Okay. So when the BP starts going down, I will you cut off my nitrous and again, the BP starts going up. Very simple management. Don't give any antihypertensive. If at all you want to use, use NTG because a high mean arterial pressure is required at least 100 and above, at least 100 and above. I will just uh, reiterate at least 100 and above a good CVP. So this is how I manage it intraoperatively. So this is the chart and we are at 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 MAC. A more than this 1.2, 1.3 MAC will severely depress. Once your vessels are clamped, the patient will go into severe hypotension and then you will be juggling between a hypotension and hypertension, NTG on one side, NORAD on other side. Don't do that. Keep it simple, KISS approach. Okay, so this is what happens in drop. Once the surgeon clamps the vessel, the BP tanks, your MAC is 1.2 and you suddenly realize, oh my God, what is this happening? So you suddenly start juggling your COs and all that. No. So harvesting of the left kidney is favored because the renal vein is longer on that side. The donor kidney is placed in either right or left iliac fossa. The renal vein of the donor kidney is connected to the external iliac vessel and urinary continuity is restored by placing the distal ureter into the bladder through a tunnel. So how many of you know that uh, once we transplant a kidney, the normal, the other kidneys are not removed? Frankly speaking, the day I started my kidney transplant, I didn't know that, right? So uh, a transplanted kidney is an addition to the other two kidneys that the recipient was having. We have done re-kidney transplant, we have done re-re-kidney transplant, and yes, we have put in a fifth kidney also. So as I told you, we should know what are the steps of the surgery. This is important again, and I will show you how it is done and what is what, what is the scenario like after the anastomosis. So this is the common uh, iliac artery dividing into the internal and the external iliac artery. This is the common. Then this, this, is, this is a division that is happening. Right In this particular case, the anastomosis to the internal iliac artery, external was having some plaques. And then this is the vein. And then here is the anastomosis. You can see the anastomosis to the vein. Yeah, external iliac vein. And this is the ureter which is stented connected to the bladder, right? So what happens if, you, if it's a, a good reperfuse kidney post uh, transplant? So this is how the urine will start coming. So till you have a visual confirmation of the urine from the transplanted kidney, hold your fluids, fluids your friend, fluid is your enemy. Remember this thing. So fluid management, this is very important, how you give your fluid. So we have need to maintain a systolic between 130 and 160. The CVP should ideally be managed between 10 to 15 millimeters. 
and equal amount of fluid replacing the urine output once the kidney trans, uh, uh, is uh, transplanted and it starts uh, the urine production starts so this is how we do it but before that you go by the ejection fraction that is what i can impress and i want to stress upon right you can choose ringer lactate you can choose uh, normal saline uh, we administer 250 ml increments to optimize intravascular volume if we feel that uh, its volume dep uh, depleted there is absolutely no difference between the fluid of choice yes colloids are to be avoided if you want to need we uh, uh, have to use use 5% albumin but limit this administration of albumin to around 500 ml blood perioperative blood transfusion is avoided if possible the triggers are normally seven but we prefer to avoid if there is no significant blood loss so yes a well perfused kidney means early onset of graft function lower post op serum creatinine reduced incidence of delayed graft function and improved graft survival so manitol is given when you give manitol is when they are doing the vein when you give loop diuretic like uh, lasix when they are doing the arterial thing right keep a cvp between 10 to 15 uh, if required uh, and if you have to give albumin use it in 1.6 m uh, maximum 1.6 ml per kg dose so avoid hypotension at all cost initially you might use ephedrine what we use at our place is norad okay low dose norad does the trick so hypertension if it happens as i told you you can go in for short acting beta blockers but or ntg may be required for control of hypertension but don't give labetalol don't give uh, propofol no then the bp will not come up management of hyperkalemia introp we all know i will not be touching on this part of it uh, yes calcium gluconate is used so management of hyperglycemia try to keep your sugars less than 200 use insulin infusions avoid hypothermia use forced air warming devices so early post op management use pca fentanyl that is what we do uh, we avoid neurexial anesthesia tap block can be used yes about especially about morphine personally i use morphine after extubating my uh, patients introp acidosis god forbid a non functioning transplant kidney and your dose of morphine patient will not wake up that is what is our experience okay so morphine we use if we want to use after extubation in the recovery area this is our patient in the post op is very comfortable we have used morphine in this patient the vitals are stable so yes be prepared for any hyper acute uh, rejection uh, it's mostly surgical we can't help uh, uh, from our side acute rejection is again very common but then it can be managed with immunosuppressive agents so transplant rejection is either acute or acute uh, humoral rejection or acute cellular so humoral rejection is more difficult to treat and typically is treated with iv immunoglobulins and plasma pheresis so you, we need to confirm it with a biopsy and this is how hyper acute rejection can look like so now uh, a very brief mention of abo and incompatible donors yes we are able to do all sorts of abo blood group types so what has made this possible is by removing existing uh, abo antibodies by use of antigen specific immunoabsorption techniques uh, use of rituximab tacrolimus so this is how antigen specific immunoabsorption is done and we need to have a titers of around 1 is to 2 to 1 is to 4 before initiating an abo incompatible transplant right so a lot of planning goes into that and this is the window it can happen late night it can happen early morning so don't say no to an abo incompatible uh, recipient who is ready so five year graft survival is equivalent to standard abo in uh, compatible living donors so it is as good as uh, com compatibility abo incompatibility doesn't matter nowadays pediatric kidney transplant this is a very technical challenging thing as the kidney is placed intraperitoneally the blood vessels are directly connected to recipient's aorta and ivc right native nephrectomy may be uh, done or required and invasive monitoring in this patient is must so this this is somewhere around an 8 year old see the size of the kidney okay pediatric transplants are very rare 
they are less than 150 to 200 in a year in in the whole world so fluid management is very important correct underlying hypovolemia use ringer lactate or saline less than 15 kg better transfuse blood so how we do it how the pediatric transplant is different bring cvp to 15 to 20 uh, before unclamping okay because be prepared for a large drop in svr replace urine output with crystalloids try to maintain a donor map of 80 to 90 in the recipient pediatric recipient okay so pressors may be required patients less than 15 kg please go for post op ventilation there is a risk of development of pulmonary edema because of uh, uh, this maintenance of adequate hydration okay so what is the take home message See, as an anesthetist, you will be always blamed because that is what we have become as a punching bag. But as far as kidney transplant is concerned, as an anesthetist, you have to ensure three things, right? No acidosis. You do an ABG, you tell your surgeon, boss, I am clear. A good mean arterial blood pressure, right? At least 110. I am telling you the lower limit is 90, okay? And a good CVP. Okay, so no acidosis, adequate hydration, good mean arterial pressure, normothermia, right? Once this is ensured from your side, you can jolly well look into the eyes of surgeon and if he is uh, questioning you, you can uh, question him by your uh, eyes only. So once my surgeon looks at me, I say, okay, my side is clear, boss. Look at your side if the urine is not coming. Okay. Another point we need to remember is that donors are not patients. We make them one. Avoid donor mortality at any cost. Right. So, as I told you, a good mean mean pressure, a good CVP, good hydration, normothermia. That is what we can ensure. And if you ensure this, I tell you, you will be always having a successful recipient. So conclusion, it's a very highly satisfying and challenging experience for any anesthetist in managing a kidney transplant. Living kidney donation is a very low risk procedure and these programs will grow with the time. We need to be very empathetic. This is a policeman from Kenya who brought his daughter. Daughter is eight year old, a very nice gentleman. There was nobody else, no other relative. So I told him, don't worry. I talked to management. Normally our donor ICUs and uh, renal ICUs are separate. When I went to meet the kid in the morning, she was complaining that she didn't get her uh, chicken in the night. Okay, be empathetic. It's a very pleasant experience. These are my kidney transplant surgeons with whom I work, Dr. Sandeep Guleria and Madam uh, Vijay, Vijay Rajkumari. She's from Tamil Nadu only. And thanks. Uh, I end on this note that may your urine patient's urine bag should always be full. So with this, I conclude. Thanks. Thank you very much. For your wonderful uh, elaborate uh, lecture. And um, uh, we have some queries that actually because of time factor, I will take on one, one or two questions here. And the remaining are there in the chat box and if you can answer it there and you'll be very happy, sir. Uh, so the question uh, which I want to take up is this role of low dose dopamine. No. Role of yeah, yeah. Uh, see, Dr. Jayaprakash, that is what the surgeons were uh, telling us. But what I have seen is that uh, a low dose NORAD is definitely better any day because what happens is that with your dopamine, you get into tachycardia and all that things. And it is not that much beneficial. It is uh, nowadays, it's not recommended. At our centers, we are uh, using low dose of NORAD. And if you're suspecting, start using NORAD right from the beginning, right from the incision. There is no harm, absolutely. Uh, do you use dexmeditomidine in your practice? Dexmeditomidine. Uh, no, no. We want to avoid in renal failure patients. We want to keep things very simple. Um, uh, see, uh, uh, Dr. Jay, you would have seen us that uh, KISS approach, keep it simple and safe, right? So keep it simple and safe. Have a standard SOP. You have to deliver a patient who is making urine. More than that, uh, nobody is interested in your technique as far as the surgeon is concerned because at the end of the day, that urine bag has to be full. So we have used, we, we thought of using Dexmed. It doesn't confer any um, significant advantage over fentanyl. That is what I feel. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank, I think thank we will move on to the next uh, session, sir. Uh, Edward, sir, shall we go for a third session? Yes, sir. We can move on to the next topic. Uh, yes. uh, the next topic is for anesthesia for uh, liver transplant. 
So that will be uh, built by Dr. Anupam Raj. She is a consultant from Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, and uh, she is very much interested in organ transplant anesthesia, robotic surgeries, uh, bariatric surgeries, and uh, ultrasound and vascular access. And she is a faculty in many conferences. Welcome, you, Madam. Over to you, Madam, for your talk. Dr. Anupam. Dr. Anupam. So viewers, uh, we are completing uh, 50th class in the December 25th. So you can send your feedback to my uh, personal WhatsApp or to my to the uh, online analysis uh, email. I think some error on her side. She's just connecting. Kindly be online. Okay, okay. Sir. Yeah. Then you, uh, Rajesh sir, you can take up the questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes. If that is. Rajesh sir. Sir. Uh... You can take up the questions. Uh, yes, sir. I will take up the. Yeah, yeah no problem. Because madam, madam is. Uh... Yeah. Uh, I'm not able to connect her, sir. Can you call there? Yeah, some problem in the connection from the Zoom side. Uh, okay, sir. There are some questions related to again pain management, region anesthesia in uh, for donor nephrectomies. Do you uh, practice the erector spinal pain blocks or quadratus lumborum blocks? Hello. I think she is. She has come on the line. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I think there was some problem with the internet on my end. That's why it happened. So. Yes, but we can start with the slides. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon. I believe uh, it's been a long day for all of you, although all the academic sessions were very good and interesting. But uh, in the last leg, now we're going to discuss the anesthesia for liver transplant. Here, uh, in this uh, uh, whole lecture, our focus is going to remain on exclusive the, exclusively on the liver recipients. And we will be discussing the whole topic into the following headings, uh, where we will have a little bit of introduction, uh, looking at various indications and contraindications. Then we will go on to the pathophysiology. Although it's basically very, uh, you know, uh, boring, but, you know, once we understand the whole pathophysiology of the liver disease patients, the remaining part becomes really easy for us. So uh, a liver transplant, it's basically the treatment of choice for the end stage liver disease patients, regardless of the etiology, whatever the etiology may be, uh, you provide a definitive treatment to these patients by, uh, by a liver transplant. Now, ever since the first transplant was done in 1960, the mortality rate has significantly uh, reduced and the outcomes have become better. So that is why increasingly the number of centers have gone up for liver transplant, the kind of patients that we are getting are becoming uh, older and sicker. And uh, definitely the major goals for doing a liver transplant is a prolonged survival. 
from a disease which has got a hundred percent mortality. Uh, once you have an end stage liver disease, uh, the survival is definitely very very less, and uh, not just that, the patient after. After the liver transplant, these patients also have a significant improved quality of life. Now, uh, the significant challenge remains for the transplant team as uh, the procedure is performed in the high-risk patients and impaired cardiovascular, pulmonary, and renal coagulation uh, system abnormalities. Now, recent publications have indicated that the transplant candidates are getting older and sicker, and the multiple associated comorbidities and organ dysfunctions are now uh, present in most of our patients. The, uh, that is why it's uh, uh, adequate perioperative care is essential for these patients to have a prompt graft function, which uh, will improve the organ system recovery and the recipient's quality of life. The indications for liver transplant remains, you know, the acute liver failure of any cause, maybe acute hepatitis A or B or drug related. Uh, cirrhosis from any of the causes, uh, which are usually the common things that we see are hepatitis B uh, infections, the chronic hepatitis C infections, alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune, cryptogenic, and the primary biliary cirrhosis. Apart from that, metabolic disorders can be present and it's usually seen in the younger age group. Malignancies uh, like a primary hepatic cancer uh, or a hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, uh, and metastatic ones like a carcinoid and islet cell tumor, uh, for that also the liver transplant has been recommended. And uh, polycystic liver disease and polycystic liver kidney disease sometimes undergo a combined liver transplant. And then the bud chiari system. Uh, the, uh, the absolute contraindications is, you know, if you is brain dead, uh, which can, why this has been put as the first, because which does become a little bit of problem sometimes uh, in the cases of acute liver failure, and we will discuss it towards the end. Uh, hepatic, uh, extra hepatic malignancy, you know, active uncontrolled infections, active alcoholism or substance abuse, uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, severe cardiopulmonary diseases, uncontrolled sepsis, inability to comply with the medical regime, uh, lack of psychosocial uh, support. So, you know, uh, the, the transplant CFF, uh, the transplant surgery will require at least a lump sum of 20 lakh or 25 lakh, you know, for the surgery, the whole package. Uh, once the surgery is done, the patient's expenditure is around 20,000 per month for at least one year when he's on immunosuppression. So you can see that, you know, uh, if because of any reason, the patient will not be able to comply to the medications after the surgery, uh, then it will sort of become a relative contraindication because, you know, this is this this much is the basic requirement for the immunosuppression for the various testing without any when when we are think, seeing that you know the patient does not have any complications at all then the relative contraindications include the portal vein thrombosis uh, psychological instability and cholangiocarcinoma coming to the pathophysiology like i was saying that you know uh, once you the patient of uh, liver disease, uh, it, the cirrhosis starts to progress. It sort of involves more or less all the organs. You know, there is not one single organ which is spared. And once we understand this whole pathophysiology and how various organs, you know, uh, are being uh, sort of affected by liver cirrhosis, we will be able to understand the implications for the anesthetist here. Coming to the CNS changes first and foremost, uh, so uh, from the diet, you know, in the intestine, a lot of ammonia is produced, which is usually taken care by our liver very nicely, and it is converted into the urea, and which goes into and is excreted by the kidney. But now, because, you know, the liver isn't working properly, there's going to be accumulation of lots of substances, including the ammonia, the glutamate, and, you know, all these will... Uh, be crossing the blood brain barrier and will be leading on to the cerebral edema, intracranial hypertension, and various sort of neuronal dysfunction. And all these effects combined together are called as the hepatic encephalopathy. So, uh, hepatic encephalopathy and raised ICP are most common sort of CNS changes. 
uh, absent or reduced hepatic clearance of various toxins, ammonia, manganese, mercaptans, short chain fatty acids, and phenols have been accounted for uh, this sort of uh, changes. Accumulation of neurotransmitter GABA. Effect of GABA is potentiated by the benzodiazepines and uh, thus their use can further precipitate the hepatic coma. Now, the patient who are with you in the ICU, if you do use uh, uh, the benzodiazepines for them, there is a, a very high chance that they can go into hepatic coma. Uh, because of these reasons only, the uh, the antagonist for benzodiazepines receptors like flumazenil has been used and has been proven to be a, a, a successful therapy for the patients with uh, with uh, hepatic uh, encephalopathy and is, it's usually tried in the ICU settings for them. Blood, the blood breakdown products like heminin, protoporphyrin 9, they all have been suggested as the endogenous benzodiazepines and thus are responsible for hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, the various enzymes of urea cycle are absent and thus leading to the accumulation of glutamine. And this being an osmotically active substance has been uh, implicated as one of the reasons of the cerebral edema. And it is usually very commonly seen in the acute liver failure patients. Coming to the cardiovascular system. Now, uh, in the cardiovascular, the end-stage liver disease patients, they usually present with a hyperdynamic circulation. Uh, with an increase in the cardiac output and uh, 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 peripheral arterial vasodilatation. Now you can see that these, these findings are very similar to the patients of the sepsis. So you can see that, you know, these patients, they have cardiovascular system mimicking very much like a septic patient without actually being a, a, in, in a frank sepsis. So the various vasoactive substances that bypass the hepatic metabolism are implicated for this. Um, apart from this, a very specific uh, entity of uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy can also be present in these patients. Cirrhotic cardiomyopathy basically results from the long-term altered volume status and the cardiac uh, uh, depressant properties of various circulating inflammatory mediators, causing the cardiac remodeling and repolarization changes and blunted ventricular response to the stress. Okay, so here is this diagram, which you can see. So this is a normal heart, basically. Now, what happens in a uh, patient with cirrhosis and portal hypertension is that there is release of various toxins derived from the GI tract, uh, the very similar ones which were responsible for the CNS changes also. Now, this leads to a reduced uh, vascular, systemic vascular resistance and an adrenergic activation. Now, over a long period of time, handling all these changes, the heart tends to uh, become, uh, sort of tries to compensate and it compensates by an elevated cardiac output, by an LV hypertrophy, and there is potassium channel dysfunction and beta adrenergic receptor uh, desensitization. Now, all these changes lead to a hyperdynamic sort of situation, uh, hyperdynamic syndrome that I was mentioning, which mimics very much like a septic patient. And then there is impaired diastolic function, exercise intolerance, and there could be QT prolongation. Now, with this a uh, compromised heart, which is trying to maintain the uh, hemodynamics of, you know, this patient, if there is any sort of precipitating factor like a sepsis or a tips, or even when the patient is undergoing the liver transplant, there could be further changes in the SVR and increased venous return. All of this will basically lead to an elevated LV filling and pressure, uh, filling pressures and inability to maintain the cardiac output at this present. So this is the time that, you know, because of these precipitating factors, the patient can land up into of heart failure, pulmonary edema, hypertension, shock, or cardiorenal syndrome and arrhythmias. Now, uh, by definition, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy has got various, uh, various components. There would be a component of systolic dysfunction. There would be a diastolic dysfunction. And then there would be some uh, extra things that we can find, the supportive uh, criteria for the diagnosis of cirrhotic uh, cardiomyopathy. In the systolic function uh, dysfunction, there's basically blunted increase in the cardiac output on exercise, volume change, or pharmacological stimuli, or resting ejection fraction of less than 55%. Amongst the diastolic dysfunction, what we usually see is that the ratio of early and late phase 
uh, of the ventricular filling, EA ratio becomes less than one. And uh, uh, prolonged deceleration time and prolonged isovolumetric relaxation time can be seen. Among the supportive criteria, uh, there would be uh, electrophysiological abnormality, abnormal chronotropic response. There could be electromechanical uh, uncoupling and dysynchrony. There could be prolonged QTC interval and large LA uh, and uh, there would be increased myocardial mass. Uh, these patients will have increased BNP and pro-BNP. And as many as 50% of these patients undergoing the LT develop some uh, signs of cardiac dysfunction uh, before the transplant. The patients with CTP class B and C presented uh, at at least with one feature of cardiomyopathy, serotic cardiomyopathy, or either the QTC prolongation or the diastolic dysfunction. Uh, apart from this, uh, as, as I said that, you know, because of the increased, uh, you know, um, safety of the liver transplant, now we are seeing more and more elderly patients coming to us for liver transplant. And thus, we do get concomitant coronary artery disease, either symptomatic or asymptomatic in these patients. Now, the presence of CAD in liver transplantation patient has been reported uh, to increase the mortality by 50% and morbidity by almost 81%. Now, as the exercise tolerance in these patients with the ESLD is significantly reduced, it's pertinent to diagnose the asymptomatic ischemic heart disease during the preoperative testing. Dobitamin stress echo has become the preferred uh, preoperative screening test to assess the adequacy of myocardial oxygen supply, valvular function, and for the diagnosis of intrapulmonary and uh, shunts and the portopulmonary hypertension. Now, uh, coming on to the next system, which frequently gets involved is the pulmonary system. The problems that we see in the pulmonary systems uh, can be as minimal as just a restrictive disorder because of the presence of ascites, or there can be hepatopulmonary syndrome, or there can be portopulmonary hypertension. We will break it down uh, into three steps from here on. Now, what happens is that, you know, uh, many of these patients, they tend to have a pleural effusion greater than 500 ml without any underlying cardiac or pulmonary or pleural pathology. And this particular entity is called as the hepatic hydrothorax. Uh, uh, the proposed mechanism being hypoalbuminemia, uh, decreased colloid osmotic pressure leading on to the accumulation of fluid, azygous vein hypertension because of the portal hypertension, leakage of ascites via the diaphragmatic defects. So there are a lot of leaky channels between the diaphragm, uh, from the diaphragm. So what some people believe is that, you know, it is the ascitic fluid shifting up into the chest. And then there is uh, transdiaphragmatic migration of the fluid via the lymphatic channels. Uh, coming to the second entity here is the hepatopulmonary syndrome. It's basically a triad of liver disease pulmonary vascular dilatation, and then there could be the gas exchange abnormalities, which will present either as an increased AA gradient, uh, more than 20 mm mercury on rumia in the sitting at rest, and thus leading to hypoxemia with a PO2 of less than 70 mm mercury. So various toxins which are coming, uh, they basically uh, lead to the vasodilatation and angiogenesis in, in the uh, pulmonary system and which causes the uh, uh, significant mismatch in the ventilation and the perfusion. You can see the normal vessels here where, you know, the capillaries are small, there is no vasodilatation and there is good gas exchange going on. Now, because of the liver disease and the persistent uh, uh, various mediators being present in the blood, they eventually lead to the vasodilatation around the alveoli and the capillary system. And uh, this leads to a dilated vessel, the capillaries, and thus the oxygen diffusion becomes a problem here. The hallmark of this syndrome is basically the intrapulmonary shunting, uh, which is happening at the alveolar level. Now, presence of orthodeoxia, basically when uh, most patients that we see, uh, they become comfortable when they are sitting up. However, you know, this is exactly the opposite what happens in the hepatopulmonary syndrome, that the patient's oxygen would actually be lower while they are sitting up. A very pathognomic uh, feature which is uh, seen here and it resolves spontaneously after the transplant for most patients. 
And the third entity that we usually see in these patients is the potopulmonary hypertension. It's basically defined as the pulmonary arterial pressure of greater than 25 mm mercury, pulmonary mean vascular resistance greater than the 240 dynes per second per centimeter raised to five. And uh, or the uh, when the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures are less than 15 in the settings of the portal hypertension. Now, because uh, the patients may present with the fluid overload, and the photopulmonary hypertension, the addition of transpulmonary gradient has also been suggested. Now, the serious com it's basically a very serious complication uh, of the cirrhosis and is usually associated with the higher mortality beyond what is predicted by the MELD. Coming to the renal system, the renal system involvement can be uh, either a presence of a primary renal disease or they can be an AKI, pre-existing acute tubular necrosis in these patients. And then there could be hepatorenal syndrome. So uh, uh, specifically, I'll be mentioning the hepatorenal syndrome because, you know, the remaining things are, you know, common to any other, you know, scenario of a primary liver disease, primary kidney disease or the uh, AKI. Now, what happens in uh, HRS is basically, you know, because of the presence of the portal hypertension, there is planconic systemic vasodilatation that has been the cause of problem at most other places in the other organ systems also. And this basically leads to effective, uh, reduce effective blood volume, and there is increased arterial underfilling. So all these leads to the renal vasoconstriction. Uh, which will further reduce the GFR. Now, when this is present for a long period of time and with the worsening of the liver function, there is progressive hypoperfusion that starts to happen, which leads to the hepatorenal syndrome. Now, uh, this is also important because AKI and HRS will have a lot of overlapping features. We really need to rule out all the other causes before we diagnose the patient as an HRS. Uh, the uh, typical things that we find here is a urinary sodium level of uh, uh, less than 10, 10 milliclin per liter, fractional excretion of the sodium of less than 1%, and creatinine level of more than 1.5 milligram per deciliter, urine, urine volume less than 500 ml in 24 hours. Now, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is uh, considered the most frequent cause of the renal failure in these patients with cirrhosis. Mechanism of HRS is thought to be the combination of reversible renal vasoconstriction uh, in the structurally normal kidneys and the changes in the vasoconstrictor and the vasodilator factors. Now, between the two types of the H, there, there have been defined the two types of HRS. Now, HRS one is basically a rapid onset over the weeks and it progresses with really fast and have got a high mortality. The renal function may reverse spontaneously when the liver function improves. And and it's most common in the patients with acute liver failure, uh, alcoholic hepatitis, and acute decompensated CLD. HRS is uh, uh, basically it's less acute and most commonly seen in the patients who are uh, who become resistant to the diuretic therapy. Now the treatment uh, of the HRS basically. Uh, uh, there are two reasons why you need to, you know, absolutely take care of the renal problems before uh, you take the patient. One, HRS can be present because of the presence of infection. So, you know, that, so the a worsening infection along with the liver uh, um, cirrhosis uh, would sort of, you know, become a sort of, you know, relative contraindication because you know that, you know, this patient, the kidney function deterioration here may be because of the infection. So a uh, general uh, treatment strategy is basically prevent and treat any, uh, any infection that you might be suspecting. Maintain the adequate intravascular volume. Most of these patients for the ascites are on diuretic therapy. So you need to stop your diuretics. You need to give a bit of fluid to these patients and, you know, make sure that no nephrotoxic agents are going check your drug charts once again that you know no no uh, medicine that can probably be causing uh, a, a decrease in intravascular volume is there then the volume losses uh, like you know if the patient is undergoing a large volume parasynthesis they all need to be replaced either by the albumin or the ffp uh, whatever you pick then along with the albumin, many medicines have been recommended for the use like, you know, vasopressin analog, like either the vasopressin or turlipressin 
or alpha adrenergic uh, agonists like adrenaline or midodrine, which comes as a tablet or the octreotide. Now, use of tips have also been uh, suggested as an alternative therapy. If the vasoconstrictor drugs, which I have mentioned earlier, they fail, and uh, uh, ultimately the you know the renal replacement therapy can be offered to these patients as a bridge to the liver transplant. Coming to the gastrointestinal system, the most common feature that we see here is the portal hypertension and various effects because of that. So uh, this occurs due to both the increased flow and increased resistance to the portal venous system. Now, once the critical level of portal hypertension is reached, the portal systemic channels will open up and they will try to decompress the portal system. And that would lead to ascites or varices at, all the port, uh, at various uh, places and then also responsible for hepatic encephalopathy, uh, hypersplenism and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, they all happen in the patient with a portal hypertension. Now, uh, coagulation system, again, is very uh, closely affected by the liver disease, and there are various components in this. So there is one hypocoagulability uh, and uh, impaired synthesis of the coagulation factors. Uh, except the factor 8 and von, von Willebrand factor. Then there could be hypo, hypofibrinogenemia. There could be impaired synthesis of coagulation inhibitors also. And then synthesis of abnormal clotting proteins, insufficient clearance of activated and degraded clotting products. And then there can also be vitamin K deficiency. Apart from this, there is enhanced fibrinolytic activity. <laughs> And there is also the quantitative and qualitative defects in the platelet. So uh, uh, the, the thing which is most important to understand here is that, you know, there are so many factors involved in the coagulation system here that at one place there are factors, you know, which is worsening the coagulation and then there are factors which are improving the coagulation. So there is no one, one test that can tell us that, you know, where are we uh, on, uh, on the spectrum of the coagulation. So uh, there would be, you know, there's low platelet, there's impaired platelet function, there is decreased levels of procoagulants, quantitative and qualitative abnormalities of the fibrinogen, decreased levels of uh, TAFI, and increased levels of TPA. Now, all these factors are basically worsening coagulation, and our standard coagulation uh, test will only comment upon these things. However, at the other, other side, there is also the factors which are improving the coagulation. Like, you know, there is decreased levels of uh, protein C, protein SD, and uh, there is increased levels of factor 8 and von Willebrand factors. So this is where, and this is exactly the reason why, you know, despite a very increased INRs or reduced platelet, sometimes the patients do not uh, bleed as much as they, we expect them to bleed. And this is by the role of the viscoelastic test started to come up in the uh, liver transplant scenarios. Coming to the metabolic system, uh, so the acid-based disorders as, uh, as well as the electrolyte abnormalities are very common. Uh, most common acid-based disorder that you will see is the respiratory alkalosis, which is basically happening uh, because of uh, restrictive lung disorder. Uh, lactic acidosis is another thing which is common uh, entity in these patients. Hypoglycemia in severely ill patients is also present. It's basically because of the diminished hepatic glycogen stores and as well as because of the diminished uh, gluconeogenesis. The other thing that we we'll commonly see and also affects the mortality of these patients is a lot is the hyponatremia. So uh, hyponatremia can be present because of various reasons. One, there is diuretic therapy that the patients are taking. Then there is exaggerated renin angiotensin aldosterone activity. And there's inability of the kidney to excrete the free water. So if the hyponatremia is only mild, that means the sodium is more than 45, uh, 125 milliclin per liter, it's usually well tolerated. However, the lower levels of serum sodium may be associated with the cerebral edema, cerebral pontine myelinosis, and especially if the rapid changes in sodium level happen during uh, intraoperative or postoperative period. 
uh, hyperpluremic metabolic acidosis is another common finding which is there. It usually happens because of the compensation of the acute or the chronic respiratory uh, alkalosis. Now, uh, here are the various implications, all of them put down in one chart uh, for us to understand. So basically, there is absent or reduced hepatic clearance. Uh, this will lead to the accumulation of opioids and pharmacologically, uh, pharmacological actions of the drugs like benzodiazepines may be prolonged. Uh, chances of hepatic coma, like discussed earlier. Now, there is decreased coagulation factors, thrombocytopenia, platelet dis uh, dysfunction. So coagulopathy, risk of perioperative hemorrhage presence of ascites, there could be decreased FRC in effect of pulmonary gas and uh, decreased uh, gastric emptying uh, and leading to the increased aspiration risk. Rebalancing of coagulation hemostasis uh, may, be, uh, 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 may make some of the patients hypercoagulable despite a reduced uh, platelet function. Uh, gastroesophageal viruses, uh, th these are important for us to know because, you know, while we are placing the NG tubes or if you're planning to use of the use the transesophageal probes for the patients intraoperatively, then there could be the presence of HPS or POPH. So hypoxemia, VQ mismatch and the pulmonary hypertension. Enhanced production or diminish hepatic clearance or the vasodilatory substances such as nitric oxide, endogenous cannabinoids, uh, which may lead to the tachycardia, increased cardiac output, and low mean arterial pressure and low systemic vascular resistance in these patients. And then the HRS, uh, which we need to treat and manage in the perioperative period. Now, coming to the perioperative evaluation, now after being armed by the, uh, you know, the understanding of the pathophysiology of these patients, I think we do understand that, you know, they have multi-system disorders. Uh, there is, your patient is going to have a multi-system disorder. They're going to be on multiple medications. They may be on diuretics, either furosemide, spironolactone uh, for the control of their ascites. They can be on beta blocker like propranolol for the control and treatment of the portal hypertension. They can also be on lactulose to enhance the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, to reduce the chances and control the encephalopathy. Apart from that, they will be on the antibiotics and uh, there could be, you know, the patients may or may not be having uh, uh, SPP. Now, a thorough uh, examination of the patient. Uh, all the tests and a multi-system involvement of the anesthetist, intensivist, surgeon, hepatologist. It's very, very important to have a team working on these patients uh, from beforehand. The other thing which is also important is that, you know, having uh, an infectious disease specialist screen the patient uh, for any possible infections. Routine testing by the ENT, eye, urogenital and dental screening is done to rule out not just the uh, any form of infection, but also any form of malignancy is a possible causes of uh, you know impending infections in the post-operative period which may become difficult to handle later on. A psychological assessment of the recipient is also important as well as the donor in the living transplant related uh, surgery. Now so uh, here's the list of the basic tests which are required and then we will uh, you know go on to one by one you know any specialized testing which is required. Most patients will have a full blood count. They'll have prothrombin time, activated prothrombin time, D-dimer, fibrinogen, renal function and liver functions available. Uh, apart from that, chest X-ray, ABG, and pulmonary function tests are usually done for all these patients. The basic cardiac evaluation includes the 12 lead ECG, echocardiography, stress testing, coronary angiography, if indicated, and we will discuss the indications. And then there would be the abdominal ultrasound uh, to look for the spleen size, to look for any other problems. Um, upper GI endoscopy to rule out viruses and how safely can we place the NG tubes or RTE probes. Colonoscopies, again, for the viruses. Uh, MRI for the liver anatomy, which usually the, uh, the surgical team will be getting it done. Psychosocial and nutritional assessment. Nutritional assessment is very, very important because that will uh, play a very important role at the time of rehabilitation of these patients. 
Now, 2D eco and bubble contrast study. Now, ecography is basically helpful in detecting the functional and structural abnormality of these patients. So there can be ventricular function, uh, uh, the problems of ventricular function, the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, like we, uh, we discussed in the pathophysiology that many of these patients will be having an LV hypertrophy. LV hypertrophy can lead to an LVOT obstruction. And uh, pulmonary artery pressures, again, for the patients who have hepatopulmonary and potopulmonary hypertension, and diastolic dysfunction, which is, again, a part of the cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. So all these things, we will be carefully, look, carefully ruling out all these problems of the patients. Bubble contrast studies are done, basically, while performing the echo to rule out the hepatopulmonary syndrome. Now, during a bubble contrast, the presence of the cardiac shunts is demonstrated by immediate presence of microbubbles in the left atrium after the venous injections of the contrast. And in case of intrapulmonary shunts, the microbubbles will appear, uh, are seen three or uh, after three or more beats after the injection. Now, apart from the echo, uh, this echo also helps identify the pulmonary artery pressure. Now, mild to moderate uh, POPH is usually not a contraindication for liver transplant. But if the pulmonary artery pressures are more than 50 and there's evidence of right heart failure, these patients are not a very good candidate for the LT. Cardiac stress imaging is performed by before the transplant to detect any uh, asymptomatic coronary artery disease. And uh, the traditional risk factors remain the same in these patients. So uh, male 45, female 55 years old, diabetes, smoker, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, family history of coronary artery disease. So these are all the patients that will require the further specialized testing. So here's a flow chart of how to go about the cardiac evaluation of these patients. So these basic tests of ECG and 2D echo will be done in all the patients. And if we find arrhythmia, a prolonged QTC, bundle branch block, STT changes, or if there is in, on 2D echo, we find a systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction or LVOT gradient valvular dysfunction or a PASP more than 40 mm, that's when it's, this patient is a candidate for a specialized testing, which will include either the stress testing and any patient who's above 40 years uh, or more and has got more than two cardiac risk factors that we discussed earlier, they all need to undergo the stress test, uh, testing uh, in the form of DAC. And for the patient where it is negative, you can proceed with the liver transplant. If the DAC is positive, then the further evaluation by the cardiologist will be mandatory. Requirement of coronary angiography, uh, whether the CAD is present or not, and uh, the treatment will be based on that. Uh, a word about various scoring systems that we have available. Uh, they are basically required for the prioritization to ensure an equitable access to the limited supply of organs. Uh, prognostic indices uh, to predict the one-year survival without the transplantation, to determine the urgency of the liver transplant. The most commonly used factors are the child turquoise puke and the MEL scoring system. Uh, uh, MEL is more objective because it gives you a number based on which you know the mortality is basically diagnosed, and it is uh, there are MEL exception points given to the patients who have got HCC hepatocellular carcinoma along with the uh, an increased MEL because um, these patients uh, once the tumor starts to spread will not have any chance of even getting a liver transplant, so. Um, Coming to the intraoperative management of these patients now. So uh, uh, for the surgery, uh, as a general rule, we uh, reserve at least 10 units of packed cells for these patients, two uh, full plasmas, 10 FFPs, 10 cryos and uh, platelet are reserved and the blood bank is usually we are in a continuous lysion with the blood bank that you know in case of any emergency uh, they will keep and arrange more cross match blood for these patients. Uh, monitoring, the general monitoring is basically a 5 lead ECG. There would be a pulse oximeter and, uh, and, and tidal carbon dioxide uh, monitor, gas monitors and BIS monitor, temperature monitoring. 
most patients uh, are basically having uh, we use two arterial lines one is for the continuous uh, avp monitoring and other is for the sampling because the sampling in these patients is done pretty frequently you will be doing an abg almost in every hour especially in the anhepatic phase. And then there would be other lab testing which will be happening frequently for these patients. So it is definitely recommended to have one separate sampling line. Central venous axis, at least a three lumen catheter. Apart from this, uh, uh, hemodynamic monitoring, most patients will also have a cardiac output monitor of one or the other form. PA catheters are basically considered the gold standard for the cardiac output monitor. However, and they also measure the CVP and the pulmonary artery occlusion pressures. Uh, uh, the problems with the PA catheter is one, the static preload measurements uh, can be a poor indicator of end diastolic volume and fluid responsiveness. And then apart from this, the cardiac output measurements uh, using thermodilution technique can be inaccurate during the time of liver transplantation. Uh, during the rapid return of the cooled blood, which is uh, going to be, you know, especially at the time of reperfusion. And then again, uh, many times these patients will require large volume resuscitation by the intravenous uh, fluid. So again, this can be a problem with the thermodilution uh, methods that most PA catheters employ. One of the most common uh, cardiac output monitor that would be used is a pulse contour analysis in the form of flow track, litro, or pico. Uh, they are comparable uh, to the pulmonary artery catheter for the cardiac output monitoring. The pulse wave analysis uh, also allows the measurement of stroke volume variation and pulse uh, pressure variance. The stroke volume variance has been shown to predict the fluid responsiveness uh, during general anesthesia and use of vasoconstrictor does not change this variation. So uh, the basic limitation is that it is not useful in a high cardiac output state when there is very high dose of vasopressor and during the major hemodynamic shifts. Uh, Transesophageal echography is basically one of the best uh, monitoring device that you can have. The myocardial function uh, for the diagnosis of myocardial uh, function for intracardiac air embolism or thrombosis and for the fluid status of the patient. It facilitates the rapid diagnosis of life-threatening conditions and uh, helps in ruling out a lot of problems that we can face during the time uh, during the surgery. So like an LBOT uh, obstruction, which might be happening, uh, various other. So for, for basically, you know, to differentiate, to, fight, to come to a conclusion that, you know, what exactly is going wrong, especially if, you know, you have a major problem during your transplant surgery, TE comes really handy. Now, the coming to the coagulation monitor, most centers will have a standby lab uh, just near the OT along with the tech monitor or a rotor monitor. So the conventional test, which are usually done every second hourly is a hemoglobin, platelet count, PT, APTT. And this is usually done in the lab, which is you know set near the uh, operation theater only, basically to reduce the reporting times. Uh, PTINR and APTT measures exclusively the activity of procoagulants and do not include any, any anticoagulant factors, just like we discussed in the pathophysiology, that you know the, the conventional test will not give you a true picture of what is happening in the patient. So both uh, the other problem with the conventional test is that, you know, they have a long ter turnaround time. Earlier that, you know, a, a lab technician can give you an answer is still 45 minutes to one hour. So thus, uh, it's important to have a point of care testing in the form of a TEG or a Rotem available in your OT complex where the liver transplant is being performed. Now, uh, despite the presence of various coagulation monitors, there is no test which is school standard. Uh, perioperative, uh, preoperative coagulation tests do not predict the intraoperative bleeding and the blood loss in the liver transplantation is often related to the portal hypertension, surgical bleeding, then the coagulopathy. <clears throat> so this is the picture of the TEG machine that we, we use at our center. And these are the signature TEGs which are available. <clears throat> Now you can see that here. So the tech usually gives you an initial report within five minutes. Most of the reports will be available within the 20 minutes. So you can at least plan what sort of therapy that you want to give based on the, you know, the picture that you are getting here, <clears throat> rather than waiting for 40, full 45 minutes to one hour for your lab test. 
Um, then coming to the rapid infusion devices, which are usually mandatory for a uh, surgery like liver transplant. Uh, level one is one of the most commonly used, uh, the rapid infuser device for, for the surgery. And it is capable of transfusing fluids or blood products at about one liter per minute. So it has an inbuilt system of uh, removing all the air in the circuit and also a uh, inbuilt system to uh, warm the fluids to the body temperature. So uh, it, it is like with the warming facility, air detection and its elimination system. It is pertinent to observe the cardiac filling pressure while using these devices because the volume overload can develop very rapidly. The other problem is if you're using the blood transfusion or uh, you know the blood products, again, you will have to keep very close watch on the serum potassium levels uh, because cardiac arrhythmias can be because of that. The um, uh, temperature monitoring is very, very essential in the transplant surgery is one because it's a very long surgery uh, will be going on for almost 18 hours. You know, the patient, uh, then the patient will be, you know, once the new liver comes in, the cold uh, reperfusion fluids will be coming in. You know, the, the liver, the new graft liver is going to be cold again. So, you know, there are multiple places where the patient can become hypothermic. Uh, most important being obviously at the time of induction of anesthesia and then when the patient is exposed for and is being prepared during the anhepatic phase of the surgery when there is no functioning liver inside the patient's body again temperature regulation is uh, almost eliminated so various forms uh, of heating devices are mandatory during the surgery then coming to the neurological monitoring. So like we said that these patients are going to have cerebral edema and encephalopathy. Some sort of neurological monitoring will be required. So conventional ICP monitors are usually not recommended in liver transplant because of the risk of bleeding and infection. Transcranial probe is basically used to measure the cerebral perfusion pressure. BIS monitors uh, help in monitoring the consciousness intraoperatively. Uh, um, as a routine, we do measure the optic nerve sheet diameters for the tentative idea of cerebral edema, especially in the ALS patients. Now, coming to the conduct of anesthesia. Now, uh, here, once you receive your patient now after having understood all the problems and the implications with the anesthesia, uh, we know that, you know, we have to consider these patients as full stomach patients because of the presence of ascites or gastroparesis or because of the, you know, the patient might have had a recent upper GI bleed and thus, you know, leading to delayed gastric emptying. So uh, rapid sequence induction is usually required. A full, nice pre-oxygenation is also required because, you know, like we discussed that these patients, they have restrictive lung disorders and there would be reduced FRC and they, they desaturate really, really fast. They de-recruit de their lungs also really, really early. So apart from this, they tend to have very unpredictable pharmacokinetics. So volatile anest anesthetic. Uh, the volatile anesthetic that you would be using would be either an isofluorine, dusfluorine, or a sevofluorine in these patients. Fentanyl is used basically to blunt the sympathetic response, and it is also used as a continuous post-operative analgesia. Midazolam uh, is used uh, because of the minimum effect of, on the hemodynamics and also because it causes amnesia. Now, here in these patients, intraoperatively, you can, of course, use midazolam. Uh, uh, where it's contraindicated and cause hepatic encephalopathy is in the preoperative time and, you know, in the during the ICU care. Here, your patient is anyway going to be under anesthesia. And, you know, if you do want to reduce the dose of propofol or any other anesthetic agent, uh, we routinely use midazolam. Neuromuscular blockade uh, for RSI, you can use rocuronium. And then uh, atro as a standard, we use an atracurium infusion for the intraoperative uh, maintenance. Now, the whole management of the surgery basically depends just like what Dr. Anil was discussing, that we do need to be absolutely in sync with what the surgical team is doing. And uh, liver transplant surgery is an absolute example of this. So, you know, it is, you know, it has got various phases. Most of the anesthesia management will depend upon what the surgical team is doing at that present time. So that is why the management has been divided uh, into three parts. 
uh, the first being the dissection phase, then the anhepatic phase, and then the reperfusion phase. Broadly, what is happening is once we have induced the patient, now we have two arterial lines set, two large pore IV cannulas set. We have a central line set. We have a PA sheath if we want a PA catheter. We have put our, you know, ABP monitoring, CBP monitoring, cardiac output monitoring. We have a urinary catheter, temperature monitoring. And, you know, the patient is nicely covered, draped, uh, you know, the temperature monitoring devices are set and we hand over the patient. Once the surgery starts, the first phase that is there is the dissection phase, which basically starts with a surgical incision and it lasts till the vessels of the uh, uh, liver are clamped. So, uh, you know, vessels like the hepatic artery and portal vein, once they are clamped and the liver is now not getting any sort of blood supply, the both the, both the uh, major vessels which were supplying oxygen to the liver have been clamped. So that whole part is basically called the dissection phase. So what is happening here is that, you know, they're going to open up the liver, they will clamp various vessels, you know, they will uh, do the dissection, reach the liver area. They would also at this point in time, will be dissecting all the collateral vessels, you know, they'll be trying to prepare and move and mobilize the whole liver to be taken out. So these hepatic artery and the portal vein clamp is done as the last, so as to enhance the, you know, basically to reduce the anhepatic phase, which is going to follow this. So once these vessels are clamped and till the time the new liver comes in, this is basically an anhepatic phase, a phase where there is no functional liver in patient's body. And you will be seeing maximum metabolic problems during this time. Now, once the new liver has been implanted, the vascular anastomosis of the veins, the portal vein and the hepatic vein is done. Uh, usually, the this is the point where the liver graft is uh, reperfused. Again, uh, uh, the artery and the biliary anastomosis are done after the reperfusion. So that is all part of the reperfusion phase. So now at this point, because you have a new liver, you have a graft which has come in, there would be, you know, the reperfusion syndrome. So the problems in this phase are going to be, again, different. And now we will be, you know, uh, discussing all the problems that happen during these phases. So like I said, the dissection phase, it's basically, you know, which, which starts with an inverted T or an extended or bilateral subcostal incision. And the structures around the liver, in, infrahepatic, suprahepatic vena, fota, hepatis are mobilized in hepatic artery and bile duct are divided during this time. A table-mounted Thompson and Omni is most commonly used uh, to facilitate the intra-abdominal exposure. Uh, when they are applying the retractor, there will be a transient decrease in the venous return to the heart and there will be a reduced cardiac output. So retract the application can also result in transient arrhythmias in some of the patients. So this is very important. Uh, this happens before the whole, once the incision is done, the next thing that they do is they put a retractor there. So, you know, you have to be watching for the blood pressure and the changes during this time. And if uh, the blood pressure is pressure is not coming up, you need to alert your surgeon, either the relief of retractor or, you know, they need to put it back again. So this is a very important step. And then uh, uh, because a lot of mobilization of the vessels and uh, suprahepatic vena cava is happening at this point in time, this is also one of the problems uh, that massive bleeding and major fluid shifts can happen. Now you see, because here the bleeding is mainly happening is the surgical bleed. So, you know, you need to, rather than using, you know, you will be losing a lot of blood and you need to be alerts that, you know, what exactly is happening. So, you know, if you're losing blood and blood products, you may have to use more fluids and blood products in this time, rather than using the vasopressors. Then uh, drainage of the large volume ascites uh, and excessive bleeding in these patients because of the portal hypertension and many collaterals. Uh, uh, and if the patient has had any sort of previous abdominal surgeries, or if it's patient who has been treated for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis repeated times earlier, they all have a higher chance of bleeding in this phase. So fluid resuscitation is usually needed with the balanced salt solutions, albumin replacement, and the blood products are the mainstay of maintaining the hemodynamics at this point in time. Large volume ascite drainage parasynthesis, when it's happening, uh, you may also need to replace albumin at that time. So the excessive use of crystalloid can uh, cause the coagulopathy and hypocalcemia, hypothermia, acidosis. 
So you need to keep a close watch. As a routine, we do uh, the ABGs, serial ABGs every second hourly of these patients. Uh, our ABG machine will also tell us the idea of the various electrolytes which are there, and we keep on correcting them uh, simultaneously. Transfusion therapy is best guided by the TEG or Rotum, like I have discussed. So the most crucial goal during this stage is to optimize the fluid status. Important to remember that the dissection phase, we're going to lose some blood during the surgical bleeding. So the replacement, the maintaining of hemodynamics primarily depend upon the fluids and blood products and albumin and cautious use of vasopressors at this point in time. So once the vessels have been clamped, the hepatic veins, portal vein and hepatic artery, once they have been clamped, the liver is going to be removed. And this is where after the clamping, the anhepatic phase is going to stop. <clears throat> This stage also involves preparation of IVC for implantation and uh, following which the new liver will be inserted. Now, systemic hepatic function ceases completely. Obviously, whatever little function that the cirrhotic liver was doing, now it is all out of the circulation. There is no functional liver in your patient right now. And... Um, uh, this leads to rapid development of the acidosis, hypocalcemia, uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, there could be acidosis and anuria, which can lead to hyperkalemia at this stage. So, uh, so these are the major problems that we are going to face now. So the calcium is going to drop, the acid-base imbalances are going to start, the electrolyte imbalances are going to start. Patient may need the uh, dextrose infusion uh, to support the glucose. They may also need you know, insulin dextrose infusions for the treatment of hyperkalemia during this phase. Then the venous return from the inferior vena cava is partially or completely occluded. Thus, the hemodynamic in instability is also common. So now, because there is more of acid-base acid abnormalities and, you know, because there is less losses happening right now, the mainstay of the hemodynamic maintenance will be on the vasopressors. So uh, they are ideally maintained by the vasopressors rather than the fluid, uh, which is... Uh, which was the mainstay of the treatment in the earlier part of the surgery. Now, excessive fluid resuscitation during this stage can lead to congestion of the... So if you end up giving a lot of fluid during this stage, once the new new liver is uh, reperfused, there, will, there can be congestion of the graft, which may not be a very good idea for a good graft function at this point in time. Again, the coagulation factor synthesis does not exist in this phase. So blood component therapy guided by the viscoelastic test is, uh, will be continued during this. Severe coagulopathy uh, is directly proportional to the length of anhepatic time. So the longer the anhepatic time in your patient, the more coagulopathy you're going to have. And apart from this, the various anticoagulant factors like the uh, TPA, heparinide products, uh, that are generally metabolized in the liver, they keep accumulating. Thus, these products are what will basically lead to hyperfibrinolysis also during this time. So again, TEG is going to help us whether we need any antifibrinolytic therapy or not. So once the anhepatic, so now the new liver has been uh, implanted and the vessels have been anastomosed, uh, the hepatic vein and the portal vein anastomosis is done. The liver graft is reperfused, and this phase is now the new hepatic phase. Now, in this stage, this involves a graft reperfusion, which is followed by the hepatic artery anastomosis and the biliary construction. Now, immediately after the reperfusion, the newly implanted graft, <laughs> the significant hemodynamic changes occur in within the next five to 10 minutes. <laughs> there is a lot of venous return because, you know, the IVCs were clamped earlier. Now that unclamping will happen and a lot of venous, the venous return is going to increase suddenly, which will lead to an increased cardiac output and increased blood pressure. However, immediately after this increase in the blood pressure, it may be followed by a downslope because of the accumulated ischemic uh, uh, substances, because of the high potassium in the perfusion solution, and uh, because of uh, there is a depressed cardiac activity or there is a defective heart or cirrhotic uh, cardiomyopathy heart, which have problem in handling so much of fluid at this point in time, uh, all the venous return. Now, this leads to a decreased cardiac output and decreased blood pressure. These can worsen the pre-existing pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. 
there is a specific entity of post reperfusion syndrome that is basically defined as 30% reduction in the mean arterial pressure for at least one minute and occurring within the five minutes of graft reperfusion. PRS is also associated with the increased graft dysfunction and mortality. Uh, a word about, so, you know, now this is what are the phases of this transplant. A uh, little word about what are the problems that you can face during the intraoperative period and how are we going to manage it? First and foremost is the massive bleeding. So now, you know, uh, for most, we said that, you know, we are going to be checking for the conventional tests like the PT, APTT, INRs uh, every second hourly. So along with the tag or the rotor monitoring, which is specific for uh, uh, for the, you know, to see the function that how the, you know, the blood clotting is happening. However, in a patient which is having a very rapid uncontrolled bleeding, it's important to understand that the treatment is going to be fluids and the rapid replacement of the blood products. At this time, you may not be able to rely on any of your tests. So you will have to go back to the standard fixed ratio transfusion if the bleeding is very rapid and very heavy, and you will have to give one is to one is to one, PRC, FFP, cryo to this patient, no confusions there. Once the bleeding slows down, we can convert the, uh, it to, you know, uh, we can check, for the viscoelastic test and guide our management based on that. However, if your patient is having only a slow uh, protracted uh, bleeding, then you can uh, treat it with the fluids or early use of vasopressors and uh, uh, point of care testing. Uh, the other problem that you can face during the intraoperative period is intracardiac thrombus. Uh, uh, ICT presents intraoperatively as the right ventricular failure. So there could be hypoxia, hypotension, bradycardia, sudden increase or decrease of the pulmonary arterial pressures are basically hallmark of the right ventricular failure. Visualization of thrombus uh, by using the intraoperative T remains the gold standard. Initial management consists of inotropes, fluid, <coughs> chest and aortic compressions if required. And uh, uh, calcium chloride and sodium bicarbonate can be used uh, uh, additionally to treat if there is acidosis happening alongside. Definitive treatment uh, of ICT, of dissolving the clot. Uh, with the definitive treatment is, of course, the dissolving the clot. But, you know, uh, this is a very tough decision at any point because, you know, the patient is undergoing a full surgery and patient is already, uh, uh, you know, high risk of bleeding. So uh, that needs to be discussed. And uh, uh, after the use of TE, the reported incidence of symptomatic, asymptomatic, both sort of uh, intracardiac thrombosis is as high as 26%. The other very typical problem that we very often face is an intraoperative vasoplegia. A vasoplegia is basically defined as a normal or a high cardiac output state with difficulty in maintaining the mean arterial pressures of above 60 mm of mercury uh, due to the low systemic vascular resistance despite using high uh, vasopressors, <coughs> not adrenaline. So when you're using at least two of the vasopressors and despite that you know you remain in a very low sort of SBR state that's what we define as a vasoplegia and it may be difficult to differentiate the vasoplegia from an ischemic reperfusion injury or a post reperfusion uh, syndrome because very often it happens around that time so maintenance of the blood pressure with the fluid inotropes is the priority but these patients are usually not responsive to the vasopressors uh, um, in the literature, I saw basically, you know, these three drugs. We most commonly use uh, is methylene blue. So methylene blue is used as uh, in a dose of 2 mg per kg as a bolus and which is followed by an infusion of 0.5 mg per kg per hour for six hours. Now, uh, methylene blue needs to be cautiously used in the patients with the G6PD deficiency. This is where the other two agents have been recommended as per the literature. 
Now, the other problem that happens during the liver transplant is an air embolism. Now, there are various reasons why this can happen. One, we are trying to maintain a low CVP most of the time uh, to reduce the amount of bleeding that can happen. There are a lot of open vessels from where the air can be sucked in. And then there's a lot of transfusion which is happening simultaneously. There can be venous you know, bypass going on. There's rapid infusion of fluids. You know, there's vascular clamping and clamping happening at the time of perfusion. So, you know, all these are the points where the air embolism can set in. Again, the TE remains a very helpful tool for the diagnosis. And then essentially the treatment is 100% oxygen. There could be, you know, you'll have to use vasopressors. And uh, Durant's position, which is commonly used for any air embolism, can be used and, you know, the air can be sucked out from the central lines. Then again, arrhythmia. Again, very frequently, it can be seen very frequently in these patients. Uh, the most common uh, arrhythmia seen is atrial fibrillation. The risk uh, and the contributing factors are basically, you know, patient may have a cirrhotic cardiomyopathy or they can have a cardiac ion channel remodeling issues. Then there could be electrolyte imbalances, impaired autonomic function or hepatorenal uh, syndromes. All these will predispose the patient to the arrhythmias. Again, the arrhythmias of any sort is most commonly found during the time of reperfusion. The treatment for the arrhythmia remains standard. You know, you may need an electri electrical or pharmacological cardioversion. If the BP of the patient is stable, you can use beta blockers or diltiazam to control the heart rate. And you also need to watch for any electrolyte uh, and metabolic uh, imbalances. So the intraoperative complications can take place in any phase, and most of them occur in the reperfusion phase. Hemodynamic collapse because of the bleeding, with or without obvious bleeding, can take place again at any time. Now, TE should be readily available to help in the differential diagnosis of the cardiovascular collapse. I would like to say that, you know, in our center, we're not using TE as a standard practice. We use only the cardiac output monitor, the Edwards monitor. And although we do have TE available for, you know, use if we do land up in a problem where, you know, it's absolutely mandatory to use. Then the point of care uh, coagulation testing uh, should definitely be used to guide the therapy. It has been found to reduce the requirement of the blood transfusion uh, tremendously. And care should be taken to maintain the temperature, electrolyte, and acid load. It is difficult to predict the intraoperative complications. Therefore, adequate help in the form of additional manpower, adequate blood products, and devices should be always be available. Most patients are shifted to the ICU and extubations happen in the ICU uh, after ascertaining the good graft function. Uh, the first Doppler is done intraoperatively after the reperfusion of the vessels and uh, once the arterial anastomosis have been done. So that's when the first uh, graft function by the Doppler is uh, checked. The second Doppler is usually checked on the day after before we extubate. We are certain that you know all the vessels are functioning normally and everything is fit and fine. Uh, that's when the patient is uh, extubated. The other ways uh, of uh, finding an uh, of ensuring that you know your graft function of this patient is you know perfect is that you know there will be a decreasing requirement of the vasopressors. Then there will be decreasing coagulopathy and then there would be uh, reducing uh, reduced uh, lactate levels. So more and more centers are now fast tracking the extubation safely at the end of the procedure in the operating room uh, or uh, upon the arrival to ICU immediately rather than waiting for long. So now uh, a word about the uh, acute liver failure here. So uh, acute liver failure can be, you know, just the Similar clinical findings that can be present because of any cause. There will be a jaundice, there will be encephalopathy with uh, cerebral edema, coagulopathy, vasodilatory state, renal dysfunction, hypoglycemia, and immune dysfunction. So uh, again, here the cardiovascular changes mimic this uh, uh, septic shock. Uh, acute renal failure invariably sets in in these patients. Uh, these patients can have higher grade of encephalopathy. So their management, uh, the very initial management, it's important to have an elective intubation to prevent any sort of, uh, you know, uh, problems happening because of the cerebral edema. 
they need to have an immediate CD uh, before, you know, as a protocol, once the patient arrives in the emergency, and if they have high grade encephalopathy, we electively intubate the patient, we put them on a deep sedation, we get a CT done to see the grades of the encephalopathy, uh, the, the cerebral edema, and then we take them to the ICU, where we sort of maintain them uh, on the therapy to reduce the ICP uh, in the ICU. Uh, CRT is also commonly employed to reduce the amount of ammonia levels. Uh, it has been found to be a very good supportive measure. Apart from that, CRT may also be required to support the renal function in these patients. Uh, hypoglycemia occurs very commonly and, and that needs to be managed. Uh, if the patient fits in into the criteria for the transplant, the similar precautions need to be continued even in the operation theater when the transplant is being done. Uh, optic nerve sheet diameter, uh, we check it routinely uh, almost every six hourly for these patients to keep an eye. Intraoperatively, also the ONSDs are checked in our, as a protocol in our institute. Uh, uh, increasingly, pediatric liver transplant numbers are also going up, and it remains a very challenging surgery uh, because, you know, patients age, their weight, and because of the multi-organ involvement. Biliary atresia is the most common cause uh, in kids, and then the second most common cause is the metabolic liver disease. Now, these patients usually have accompanying congenital malformations like the splenic malformations or situs inversus or sometimes absent IVC. Many of these kids have also undergone some form of surgery like a Kasai portoenterostomy to correct the hyperbilirubinemia early on, which can lead to the, uh, you know, the problems during the dissection phase, increased chances of bleeding again. So venous arterial access are definitely challenging. There is less chance of, you know, the most cardiac output monitors that we use are not reliable in kids uh, or in, in any patient under 20 kg weight. So they are not helpful. And then invariably, these patients are very malnourished. Uh, a one-year-old child would hardly be weighing 4 kg, 4.5 kg. Um, they'll have huge ascites, hardly any muscle mass. So, you know, the problems with pediatric liver transplant are specific and uh, very, very uh, unique. Now, uh, finally, so basically liver transplant, it's uh, advanced perioperative monitoring and appropriate management are needed to ensure the long-term success of the surgery and prevent both early and late complications. Respiratory, hemodynamic, electrolyte, neurological, GI, and nutritional state affect the outcome of liver transplant patients, and especially in the early phase after the surgery. Hemodynamic instability is crucial in the post-liver transplant management. The goal is to retain uh, the graft acceptance as long as possible and reduction of morbidity and mortality in the post-transplant patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adabong, madam for extensive coverage of this subject. And uh, we, uh, since she has uh, extensively covered the subject, I hope there is no need for any discussion. So with that, we come to the end of this session. At this juncture, I like to thank the, uh, doctor, uh, the two, three speakers of today, Dr. Anil Kumar, Dr. Anubam Madam, and Dr. Gobadi Madam. They have covered the topic extensively. I hope the, our postgraduate will remember this day forever because of uh, the most excellent presentation by the three speakers. I thank the organizers, uh, sorry, the sponsors, Akrula and the host and uh, Yevon Logics and also the Anastasia TV co collaboration. Thank you, Anandal. We will meet the next week with an, uh, another excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. Thank you, madam. <laughs>